7 p.m. May 11, 2015, on Sound City Council. If you wish to follow along at home on, um, on the computer to look at our minutes or our uh, agenda, go to www.onsound.ca slash council dash minutes dash and dash agendas with an S. Go to 2015 and look for today's date. We're now moving the meeting uh, into the regular meeting. We've met for approximately a half an hour in camera. And actually we started at one this afternoon doing strategic planning. Um, we we're waiving the um, moment of silence. Any additional items, which is number four in our list? Ms. Kepke. Thank you, Your Worship. I'd like to bring an update on the OSM conference. Thank you. Councillor Thomas. Thank you, Your Worship. I would like to mention the new Owen Sound Trails map, and I have a couple of comments about the OSM conference as well. Others? Uh, Mr. Becking. Yeah, Your Worship, i uh, just like to bring to Council's attention some uh, issues uh, with respect to our transit system. Okay, anyone else? Oh, Ms. Coulter. Thank you, Your Worship. Just an item with respect to funding for our celebration for the Pan Am Game Torch. Good, thank you. Anyone else? I'm going to give an update of some of the activities that I've uh, participated in the last two weeks. Any disclosure pecuniary interest in the general nature thereof? Seeing none. Confirmation of the minutes. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Kepke, that the minutes of the special council meeting held on April 23rd, 2015, as printed, be adopted. All in favor? That is carried. Thank you. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Kepke, that the minutes of the regular council meeting on, held on April 27th, as printed, be adopted. And all in favor? <coughs> that is carried. Thank you. Number seven, resolution. Thank you, Worship. Moved by, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Gregg. The City Council now go into Committee of the Whole to consider public meetings, deputations, public question period, matters arising from correspondence, reports, matters tabled, motions for which notice was previously given, and other business. All in favor? It's carried. Great. Thank you. Now in Committee of the Whole. Starting with number eight, public meeting. Oh, I believe uh, Councillor McManaman, motion. Your Worship, that uh, the regular council meeting of May 11th be adjourned for a public meeting respecting a proposed amendment to the city's pr procedural bylaw. And all in favor? That is carried. Thank you. So we now open the public meeting. Madam Clerk. Yes, through you, Your Worship. Notice for this public meeting was posted on the city's website on April 29th. There were no comments received prior to the agenda being published. Since the agenda was published, comments were received from Major David Kennedy. These comments were circulated to Council and the media and will be added to the agenda for the public's review. Personal information collected at this public meeting is collected under the authority of the Municipal Act. The information collected will be used in the process to amend the city's procedural bylaw and will form part of the public record. Questions about this collection should be addressed to myself. The proposed amendment to the city's procedural bylaw is to remove the faith blessing or moment of silent reflection from the regular council agenda format. This amendment is being proposed in light of the Supreme Court of Canada's ruling that a municipal council in Quebec cannot open its meetings with a prayer as it infringes on freedom of conscience and religion. Great, thank you. So now we wish to hear from the public. Does anyone in the public uh, wish to comment on the procedural change or the change of the procedural bylaw? I'll get you to come up to the microphone and uh, state your name uh, and, and place of residence for us and uh, tell us what you think. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor um, and council members. I'm. Uh, Harry Zanting, I'm a pastor at First Christian Reformed Church. Um, I'm also, rep we have a couple of ministerial bodies in this town. Um, so I'm representing the Evangelical Fellowship uh, Ministerial, 
because we could meet last week and talk a bit about this. Um, I'm also the chair of the, or president of the uh, Own Sound and Vicinity Ministerial Association, but we meet on coming Thursdays, so we didn't talk. So I'm not actually speaking on their behalf, but I am the president. Um, so they're, I, don't, I don't know what the members think, but uh, I'm speaking uh, per personally, I guess, but as the president. So we're a little um, disappointed with the decision to remove the faith blessing. Um, I think a few years ago this issue was, um, came to the foreground uh, as well and we thought we had come up with a compromise in which uh, um, the faith blessing was open to all faith groups and, um, and they could volunteer to be there and if nobody was there then you would have a moment of silent reflection. Uh, but apparently that's, uh, considering the Supreme Court decision, that's uh, not adequate anymore. Uh, we're disappointed because it's an, it was an opportunity where we as faith groups could um, contribute to this process, to this political process. Uh, we believe that God is important um, in our spiritual private lives, but also in public life, uh, God is important. I know many feel that uh, you shouldn't mix politics and religion, and um, I suppose we could debate how those two could fit together, but uh, I know I believe, and I think many with me believe, that um, uh, God is very much part of not only private life, but public life. And um, um, he's increasingly, though, being put aside into that private sphere. We also believe that God is involved in every aspect of life, including politics and public civil life. And we believe that prayer is a means to support and enhance the workings of city council. Uh, and now we'll not be able to do that in a, a public manner. Uh, although I believe that God is still part of the public life, uh, whether we acknowledge that or not. We believe God is also, um, or no, let me see. Uh, we, will con um, we will continue if you pass this bylaw or this change we will continue to pray for um, the council and their work. And we'll do that in our private lives, in our own gatherings uh, as well. And perhaps um, we'll come up with some sort of plan in which we can support the council and their activities, maybe not at your meetings, but in some other way. But I can't guarantee that at this point. Um, I think it looks like, in some ways, this decision is a foregone conclusion. And probably part of the reason is because you do not want and cannot afford uh, to go to court or anything like that. And there's you know, some threat of that possibly happening. So uh, it's not our desire to, have, to make you do that or have that happen. We don't want that either. Um, it's not our desire to push matters of faith or um, faith practices. Uh, to those who don't want to have them. Uh, I think we would, uh, we would hope that they would be received willingly and uh, respectfully uh, rather than in a hostile or angry kind of manner. We don't want that. And uh, we do not want to make this a battleground. Um, I don't think that will be fruitful uh, for anyone. Uh, but we, we do mourn the loss of the opportunity to participate and contribute to the political process here in Owen Sound in a way that we believe is meaningful. And um, we mourn the removal of God one further step from this process, although as a Christian, I believe that you can't remove God completely. He's still there in one way or another. And we would like you to reinstate the faith blessing or at least uh, the moment of silent reflection, um, but we'll also recognize and abide by your decision uh, as well. And we'll continue to pray for you um, in our community, in our community, uh, the faith communities, and we'll pray that uh, you will have wisdom, and humility, and inspiration as you serve this community. And thank you for this opportunity to, to speak. Thank you for your comments. All right. Thanks. And anyone else wish to comment? Last chance, anyone else wish to comment? Public meeting, seeing none, declare the public meeting closed. And motion to reconvene council meeting, Councilor McManaman. So moved. 
Okay, all in favor? It's carried. Thank you. So, through the public meeting, we're now up to number nine on our uh, agenda, which is uh, deputations. I believe we're hearing from uh, Linda Miles Gallinger and Michael Warren from the Tom Thompson Art Gallery Board of Management with regard to incorporation of the Tom. Good evening, welcome. Good evening, your worship, councillors and city staff. Thank you for the opportunity to come before you again, this time to present our case for incorporation. Since last September, when we received agreement and principle from council to incorporate as a not-for-profit corporation, we have consulted with our members, the public, and you. Subsequent to meeting with you last September, we embarked on developing a comprehensive business plan. The purpose of the business plan was to provide the framework <coughs> for a sustainable, incorporated, and expanded gallery. A copy of the business plan was provided to you prior to this meeting tonight. The business plan assesses the capacity of the gallery to generate new revenues. It exam <coughs> excuse me, examines potential philanthropic support from foundations. It examines all of the gallery's programs and forecasts net revenue <coughs> growth into the future. The economic impact of a new expanded gallery on our community is also considered. In short, we believe the business plan does demonstrate that an incorporated gallery will not only sustain the current programs, but an incorporated gallery will develop and grow into the best regional art gallery in Canada. To present our case for incorporation, I invite Michael Warren to come forward. Following Michael's presentation, we will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Good evening, Your Worship. Good evening. Members of Council. Thank you for this opportunity to come here again this time to more formally present to you the case for incorporation and expansion of the TOM. This is the uh, index page of the business plan that we sent to you last week. We, at the time available to us, will just be able to go through some of the highlights of this plan. Um, I should tell you that the plan, uh, this version of it, was discussed with uh, the public and our members at a meeting two weeks ago, and I think it had a good response. Uh, and so we're here this evening um, to discuss with you a plan that you asked for. You asked for two things from the gallery for incorporation. One was to bring you a sustainable business plan that you had confidence in going forward for the next five years. And the second thing you asked for was public support. And I think we have uh, both of those to present to you tonight. Why do we want to incorporate? Why do we want the next slide? Here we go. There's four reasons why we want to incorporate. Money space, art, and management. We need to reach out to new sources of funding that are not available to us now, or the gallery is simply not going to be able to expand and move forward as an entity in this community. We need to access sources that we'll talk to you about later. Space, the gallery is chock-a-block right now. We can't provide any more in-house programming, and the collection itself is in, is in the basement. Uh, there's insurance issues and there's classification issues there. We have to act on that soon. We have to have a plan. And when it comes to art, we're not in a position to collect some of the art that we want to collect. Last year we had two group of seven paintings that we were interested in. The uh, estate uh, was interested in us. And in the end, because the gallery was part of a city uh, operation, they decided to go elsewhere. This model we have here, there's only two galleries in Ontario out of 40 that has this model, Grimsby and Owen Sound. So there's nothing wrong with this model, it's brought us a long way, but it raises questions with people who want to donate art and who want to support the gallery. Slide. 
Our vision can be summed up this way. The current gallery offers about an hour and a half to two hours experience. It is not a destination experience. What we want to put together is a half to three quarter day destination experience here. Our Stratford Festival, if you like. It would be a year round destination experience that would draw people, visitors from around Ontario and beyond. 35,000 square feet with the proper uh, uh, exciting exhibitions interactive technology, a theater, uh, expanded workspaces for adults and children can be something that will be a major economic driver for this community as well as a cultural center. It is a cultural center now, but the scale that we're talking about is quite different and very exciting. Now, how does the TOM compare uh, right now, the existing TOM? Because if we're, not, if we're not doing a very good job now, then why would you uh, want to stand on the shoulders of what we're accomplishing now? The TOM is punch, punches above its weight when it comes to uh, support from art galleries, uh, from, uh, excuse me, art councils, uh, federal and provincial business sponsors. We do a good job of raising revenue ourselves, self-generated revenue. For every dollar right now that you invest in the gallery, we go out and raise two more dollars. And that's one of the best propositions that the city has right now. As a percent of our budget, and down at the bottom, I'm not sure you can see those figures, but you have them in front of you on the screen. As a percent of our budget, it's about somewhere around 30%, 31%. This is modest compared to the support that other municipalities give their galleries. Their gallery support is in the range of 40 to even 70%. But on a per capita basis, this city is punching above its weight when it comes to supporting the gallery. So I think we can say that the support has been generous and it's been long term and it's been successful. The center of this presentation is the assumptions that we're making in this plan. First of all, we're going to attract revenue from three sources over the next five years from foundation grants that are not available to us now from uh, sponsorships and uh, donations to an extent of about 180,000 and increased our, our, will increase our self-generated revenues by about 100,000. Those three areas, and I'll go into them a little bit more detail in a minute, are the three major areas of net revenue expansion that we see before us. We're also gonna go after some very large uh, capital contributions from trustees of the uh, art foundation who've been really there for the last couple of years waiting for this incorporation to take place. Some of them will not give major gifts to a gallery that is part of the city. So um, our incorporation will allow us to go after them uh, much more aggressively. We think that the Canada Council and the Ontario Council for the Arts will continue to support us. Uh, modest increases each year, but uh, in, in the end, uh, we're not going to be able to rely on them. The economic impact in the city, and I'll get into that in a little detail in a moment, is somewhere between about four million and about eight million, depending on the calculator that you use to determine that economic impact. We'd like to obtain a property that allows the gallery to build a 35,000 square foot building at about $300 a square foot for about $10.5 million for the new building. Well, what will the foundation do? The foundation, first of all, is going to help us to attract more art. Part of their role is not just to raise money, but also to go out across Canada and make sure that we are there fairly aggressively with people that want to give their art uh, through, their, uh, through their estates, through donations that they want to make in terms of tax, uh, tax uh, uh, advantage donations. And we're not out there right now. They know about us, but we're not out there aggressively across the country. And that's part of what the Art Foundation will do. There uh, is the um, sources of funding that we are going to go after for the 10.5 million. And you'll notice the first category are corporate and individual donors from across Canada, outside this region. And there are people there, we're very used to Tom Thompson, but Tom Thompson is actually a Canadian icon. And there are many people across the country that think we should be celebrating him in a much more robust way. The city of Owen Sound, our assumptions there 
are that, first of all, you would approve the incorporation of the TOM as a separate non-for-profit corporation, that you would transfer the art collection uh, under a trust agreement, which we'll discuss in a few minutes, that protects the city's interest in perpetuity, donate city property, and provide transition grants of 325000 a year from 2016, next year, to the end of the transition period, which would represent a net increase to the city of $36,000 a year. You're paying right now for uh, the building costs, about 60000 and the remainder of your 289000 donation is in the form of some of the wages. We would take over all of those expenses and in return, excuse me, ask for uh, 325000 as a transition uh, grant going forward for the next five years. Here is the basic core of the revenues and expenses going forward for five years. We have three primary uh, revenue streams, government and um, sponsorships and donations and our own earned revenue. We see future government support as being limited. We see the potential for future support coming from private funding. If we drop down to the bottom of that slide, you'll see nearly a half a million dollars, which is the three categories of funding that we're looking for going forward. And in the business plan that you have, this document here, this 60-page document, there's 11 pages of analysis that support that figure that you see there. $479,000. This is not something that we pulled out of, out of the air. So where are all these sources of funding that we keep saying we can't have access to? Well, there are some samples. This is only a few samples of galleries around Ontario. Uh, Windsor Gallery, the Kitchener-Waterloo Gallery, the Hamilton Gallery, Mississauga many others. Look at the McMichael Canadian Art Collection, lower right-hand corner of your screen. All of those foundations and organizations are all providing, at one time or another, support to the McMichael Collection. We don't have access to any of those. We don't have access to the ones that the Gallery of Hamilton is going after. And so, if you start to look at these, we don't even have access to the Ontario Trillium Foundation for art purposes. So, there are other galleries, we've just picked these to show you examples of the foundations and sources of funding that we cannot go after as a city owned and operated gallery. And that's been a situation for a long time and we're sort of reached a plateau now of funding because we can't, we can't go here. I mentioned the economic impact at the time. We didn't do this um, in sort of a, a quick fashion. We looked at two calculators, one on the low end which is the American in the Arts calculator, which, which came up with a fairly narrow definition and contributes, uh, say, say that an expanded gallery would contribute about 3.5 million to the local economy. And then we used the Ontario one. And the Ontario um, calculator is trim, and it looked at both on-site and off-site visitors and came up with uh, 8.5 million economic impact every year on this community. That's very significant. I don't think there's very many proponents that are coming before you, uh, Mr. Mayor, with uh, a proposal that has this level of economic impact on the community. I know that there are people here that have worked on economic development for many years. This project has been one of the front and center projects for a long time, and now we'd like to move on to incorporation and realize some of these economic impacts. The capital project itself would have impact, obviously, and the bottom one is difficult, impossible really to um, quantify, but we work with a lot of different social agencies, schools and other community groups, uh, social service providers. If we expand, we're able to expand our partnerships with them, and this is very important to those agencies as well. So what is the primary rationale for coming here this evening and asking uh, this council to uh, approve the recommendations that we'll get to in a couple of moments. We're bringing right now two dollars for every dollar that you've invested over the years. Our budget is 947,000 and your investment this year is 289,000. We think in five years from now you'll be, this community will be receiving somewhere in the range of four dollars for every dollar invested. 
And we think that that's, that's something that we're, we're clearly capable of. I mentioned the economic impact, but this is also long-term a legacy project for this community, one that, that uh, has the potential to be a serious part of the economic growth of this community. So we're asking for an, an annual grant, which is 325,000 beginning next year, which is 31% of our current budget, which is the same percentage as this year's. And that represents an increase of 36,000 annually. The transfer of the collection. What we're proposing here is that the city draw up a trust agreement. And the trust agreement would have a variety of provisions that the gallery must abide by. And if the gallery does not abide by one or other of those provisions, the, the legal and beneficial ownership of the art reverts back to the city. The city currently owns the art legally and beneficially. So we're saying, let's have a trust agreement. You draw it up. You tell us what the provisions are. Certainly, the gallery would have to remain in own sound and perpetuity. The collection would have to remain here in perpetuity. Uh, we would have to make sure that there's provisions uh, that, that uh, control anything to do with the sale of the art. We'd have to make sure that if the gallery was ever wound up, that the art would revert back to the city. And there's other provisions. So we see this as the most logical way of providing the gallery with the collection, but at the same time making sure that there are strict regulations associated with how the gallery functions and uh, the commitments that it makes going forward in a formal trust agreement with the city. The governance structure was one that we discussed at the public meeting, and there was a couple of members here of council were at that meeting. We appreciated their attendance. We're proposing a board of directors of nine uh, people. Uh, one would be named by the city of Owen Sound to reflect their past and future support. Two others would be directly elected by the membership, and the remainder would be appointed by the board. One would have to be an artist of that six, and the other would be the chair of the, uh, of the art foundation. This is a, a hybrid. Our, our lawyers suggested a closed version, which is what I think the Billy Bishop Museum is, for example. It's a closed version. Only, yeah, only those people that are on the board can vote for the directors. There's an open version of this. The Ontario Humane Society is fully open. And sometimes that means you have popularity contests for who are going to be on the board. And this is a pretty serious plan. It's fairly complex. There's a lot of commitments here. So what we need is the ability to also make sure we have people with the right skills on this board going forward. So this is a hybrid between closed and open. And it's, uh, it's not unique, but it's fairly unique. So these are the recommendations, Your Worship. One, that you approve the incorporation of the TOM as a separate non for profit corporation. Two, that you enter into the trust agreement that I talked about and be your trust agreement. We provided the uh, acting city manager with an outline of one, but this would be an agreement that you would obviously put in place. Three, facilitate the transfer of all city employees. Four, donate the land and building when that, where that's appropriate to the incorporated gallery and provide an annual grant beginning in 2016 of 325000 annually, a $36,000 increase each year. Thank you for your attention, and we're happy to answer questions. Questions? Uh, I'll start with Councillor Lemon. I have uh, a number of questions. Uh, number one, in respect to the collection, under the trust agreement, I would assume there would be a clause that the uh, collection could not use, be used for collateral security. That's right, yeah. Okay, that's one. The one thing I'm having a great deal of difficulty is with the board structure. Um, I don't disagree, I'm not saying I disagree with the incorporation, but your ratio would, of uh, the nine members, I believe it was, three of which would be influenced by the public, either as a council appointee or by the board, or by, excuse me, by the general membership. And six votes would accrue to the existing board. 
that ratio to me is not acceptable, and that is on the basis of what I saw under the uh, Billy Bishop board. Um, I believe the membership is why the Tom is here, and I can go back to when my great uncle was involved at its inception, G. Webster Butcher. I believe in the Tom. I believe strongly in the arts community. But I really believe an open board or more open board uh, is necessary. And where I'm having a problem is your ratio, mm -hmm. which is one third public, either the city or the membership, and two thirds the board itself. My problem with self perpetuating boards is that you get more of the same continuously. You do not allow for new thoughts, new ideas, as much as a completely open board. I can understand having a couple of restricted seats, but I think your ratio should be flipped where it's six open and three closed, possibly. I think I could live with that, but I certainly can't live with a 33% uh, public uh, because uh, the city has a vested interest in the success. Yeah, I, I think there's a certain danger in a completely populist board, but I also think there's an inherent danger with a board that's completely controlled from within. Uh, and I have seen these organizations uh, in a number of areas, and oftentimes this problem of rigidity comes in. So those are my comments. You've answered the one very satisfactorily on the status of the collection, which I'm very sensitive to. But the other is in terms of the reporting structure, um, I think, yes, there should be a council member there because you have an asset of how many millions, I don't know, um, that is technically owned by the city. I have no problem with the city giving you the existing building. No problem with all those areas, but it is in the board structure. Um, that structure just doesn't work for me. Thank you, Councilor Lemon. Other comments? Councilor O'Leary. Thank you, Worship. Oh, Thank wait you. a minute. I didn't Can give I you an answer. I didn't give you an answer to a uh, chance to answer that. Sorry, yeah. it was a question. Um, Sorry, Brian. You can discuss the balance between uh, uh, in the hybrid, how much, how many of these board members should be um, um, put on the board by members and how many should be uh, designated by the board. One of the ways of making sure that the board is fresh and uh, uh, is to set board terms so that we have some members for a year, we have two, some members for two years, and that moves members off. One of the reasons why we've set the balance we have, and it's one that our members seem to think is, is pretty reasonable. We've set this balance because for a while, we really need to make sure that the members that are brought onto this board have business skills, they have project management skills, they have a variety of skills that can assist the uh, management of the gallery with something that is a pretty complex and challenging process. I think as you move on, in time, um, the first annual general meeting of the NUCO uh, would be probably this summer if we get this incorporation. Um, that model that we've just talked about would probably be voted on uh, at the first annual general meeting. We would propose what we brought here. We're listening to what you're saying. And I think in the, uh, the, the balance that we've put forward now can be, to some extent, uh, controlled by uh, graduated uh, length of members, uh, membership on the board, and moving away from that model uh, in the future when we're past this really challenging uh, management and implementation process. So that's the rationale for it. I, I take your point. Thank you. Now I'll go to Councillor Larry. Sorry. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you, Michael and Linda, for your presentation. Uh, I have two or three questions here. Uh, in your report, you're talking about getting money from outside municipalities totaling a million dollars. Do you have a breakdown on that or? I think it's 500,000 actually. Okay, it says a yeah. million, but. So uh, maybe I, you're, I maybe you're that, including, I, you're I including. 500,000 would be a challenge, but at the same time, if we don't try, uh, we're not going to succeed. And 
the membership of the gallery is more outside the city of Owen Sound by quite a lot than it is inside. So to some extent, this is a regional entity. It's in the city of Owen Sound. This city is supporting it financially, but we have members from all across the region. And when we get this campaign going, we're going to be talking about a gallery that will service the whole region and, and other parts of Canada. So that will be the rationale, whether we're successful or not uh, with surrounding municipalities will be another issue. Okay. And uh, on page 16, I've highlighted a small paragraph here. It says, there is potential for the TOM to operate at a higher level to move past the $1 million ceiling. To do so will require that several things be put in place. One of those factors is city support. Compared to other municipalities, the city of Owen Sound should be investing more in Tom's growth and potential as an economic driver for the city and region. So when I, when I read a comment like that, I'm assuming that's the opinion of the board. I automatically went to your budget and you've given us a list here of 11 uh, art galleries and, and their budgets are all between 450,000 and 1.5 million, give or take with the exception of one, and that's London, with a budget of three and a half million. So, I mean, the three and a half million just makes the, the average false. So I excluded London, and, and I look at the group of 10 that you've given us, mm -hmm. and it includes big centers. And I, I don't know art galleries, but I just know that they're big centers. That uh, This puts you in a group with Oakville, Mississauga, Kitchener, Waterloo, um, Peterborough, Thunder Bay, Ottawa, and I've looked at the average budget and I'd like to know why the TOM budget would be 127,000 a year higher than that average. Well, um, on page 15, what I'm looking at there is that list of, of uh, art galleries with budgets, as you say, if you take London out, uh, you, you've got the McLaren at million five and the Ottawa gallery at a million one. The point I was making, I guess, on the slides is that we are asking for more. We're asking for 36,000 a year more in terms of operating support. And that's the extent to which we're um, looking for additional operating funding. Uh, I did make the point that if you take that slide, that chart, and you look at it on a per capita basis, the current funding from this city is very generous. So it depends on how you view this, and I agree with you that you can view it by taking out London and looking at the averages, or you can look at it on a per capita basis. On a per capita basis, Owen Sound is near the top of that list that you see on page 15. Right. And, and the higher your budget goes, the lower our percentages if we're getting yes. the same so amount if, of money. If we stayed with, theoretically, if we stayed with 325000 from now until 2020, in 2020 the percent of our budget would be, of the city's contribution would be 22%. So it would drop from 31 to 22 uh, during that five-year period. Because our budget would be growing, but the amount of operating support from the city would be static at 325. Okay. Uh, and my final one is, it's more of a comment, but uh, if, if and when this all comes to fruition, you're moving uh, your organization into a not-for-profit organization, mm -hmm. um, and you're going to join some big players in the city, like, um, the Salmon Spectacular, Summer Folk, they all have a big economic impact in our city. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I checked, I think we have some 150 groups that are not-for-profit and own sound. And when you add up the number of, of dollars we give all of those groups, it's zero. And I don't know if you've looked that far ahead, but I really worry about how we're going to justify, once you go into that group, how we're going to justify giving you 325000 a year and all those other groups, zero. Well, it's a decision that council has to make, but uh, if you looked at all the other galleries on that list, and that's not the 40 galleries in Ontario, that's just a sample of the ones that are around our size, right. you'll see that the level of support from municipalities for those galleries, whether it's the AGO or whether it's smaller galleries like all the way down to Grimsby, is generally speaking higher as a percent of budget than what we've come to this this year over the last few years where it's where I think the council has deliberately said to the gallery and, and rightly so get more independent try to get you, yourselves down from 315,000 to 2008 down to where you are today which is 289,000 and going forward um, I think that that um, 
if we're going to have put in place a 35,000 square foot gallery and we're going to go out and raise 10.5 million to make it happen and we're going to put programs in place that will attract people from all over this country <coughs> to something that is going to be 12 months of the year. The Sound of Spectacular is great, I contribute to that. There's lots of programs here. This is something different. The scale of this is something different. <coughs> the scale of this is very large. It's, it's, it's uh, month after month and it's something that will attract people to this community uh, in a way that I, I think, I can't think of another destination experience offering that the city has at the moment. I'm talking about an annual one now, where it's open all the time, where we can promote it all the time, mm -hmm. where it becomes synonymous with Owen Sound. Even the hockey team, which is great, going all, it's, it's, a, it's a seasonal thing. This is a 12 month a year, uh, uh, 35,000 square foot destination experience. And so that's the reason why we're asking this council to allow us to incorporate and to provide us with $36,000 more on top of a generous donation you're making now. The end game here is to have a, a destination experience that really does something for tourism and for uh, this community. So I think it's a little different than some of the other uh, events that you're talking about. They're all great. But this one could be spectacular. All right. Thanks, Michael. Okay. Thank you. So Scott or uh, Councillor Greg, sorry. Thank you, Mayor Body. And thank you to the team at the board that's worked so hard on this project and to you as well, Virginia, for your leadership at the Art Gallery. I have some questions. Some of them are on numbers. <clears throat> I guess I'll start with one uh, question. If as a foundation you had granted or, or donated to the Art Gallery, let's say a three million dollar painting and something occurred to the art gallery in four or five years we know now that it would be the intent of the donor that they are not donating to the city and that's to the art gallery mm -hmm. now if there's a legal agreement in place here that the art remains with the city what could occur to that particular piece of art donated during the term of or the time period where the foundation's in control here uh, you mean the now, now, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm asking, should something occur um, similar to Windsor, where the city had to go back in and I think they took the building back because the art gallery is not being able to, to float? What would occur if it became, if the art gallery essentially in five or six years was not able to sustain itself to? pieces then, of art donated during that time and period. the art that was donated to the gallery under the trust agreement that you would draw up, uh, would, that would, part one of the provisions in the trust agreement would be not only when the gallery, if the gallery is to be wound up, that's the most extreme case, that the art would go back to the city. But if the gallery clearly was not performing financially well, and that has to be stated in this trust agreement in a way that's reasonable, then the art would return to the city as well. So that there's a performance requirement here on a number of fronts, keeping it here, making sure that it's properly maintained and managed. I didn't give you all of the items in the trust agreement because we only have a short period of time. So that trust agreement, the city should draw up and make sure that the provisions to protect the city in terms of performance of the gallery is as robust as you want it to be. And it has to be reasonable, but uh, that's something that we should be negotiating, I think, between the city and, and, the, uh, and, and the, the gallery board. So we're happy to do that. Okay. But I'm not sure I've answered your question. Well, you I, I, I think the concern with, with, which I'm stating is if I'm a donor, I am donating future to the art donor, gallery. Future, future donors, donors yes. Future donors, we understand the art now. Yeah. What about the art donated in two years, when, three years when the art gallery is well, that, that, would, so that, that art would be donated to the incorporated gallery. It would form part of the collection. And then the question is, does that portion of the collection going forward belong to the incorporated gallery and never go back to the city? Or does any of the art donated going forward go back to the city if the gallery doesn't perform properly? So now we're into a negotiation. We're not negotiation. We're just a discussion about this trust agreement. So that's something that we would be quite prepared to sit down with the city. We sent the city an outline just to get that discussion going of a trust agreement that would cover the point you've just made and others. 
And so I think it's the city that would probably have to come back to us now in discussion with the staff and say, this is the trust agreement that we'd like to have. And we would look at that and say, can we operate with that? Is that reasonable? So. Okay. I understand. So we really don't have an answer on that one. Well, because it's uh, one approach is to say all the art that's donated after we incorporate belongs to the incorporated gallery and would never go back to the city. Another way of saying it is if the, the, the art that's donated after the incorporation would go back to the city <coughs> under certain conditions. I mean, if we took, tried to take uh, the, the art gallery out of Owen Sound or we tried to take the collection out of Owen Sound, I think any of the art that the gallery would have would probably go back to the city. So, uh, you know, I, we haven't got, this is a business plan of 67 pages already, so we're happy to sit down and negotiate an agreement. And, but you're raising one of the issues, there's several others that have to do with the gallery's performance. What is that performance? What are those areas of performance that the city wants to be comfortable that going forward they are fully protected? Uh, next question, I wonder if we can just take a, a look at pages eight and 14, because there's a little contradiction on your revenue sources for numbers. Let me see if I can get us back there. One page states two million coming from the Didn't province. You, you were doing and feds. Is this here? In the business plan? In the business plan, yes. Oh, in the business plan, okay. What pages? Eight and 14. So eight suggests two million dollars each from the federal and the province and surrounding area municipalities for one million. And then we go to 14, and we've got a contradiction here. Well, the 14 is the right number, and if we have a million dollars, and I think uh, Councillor O'Leary mentioned a million dollars as well, we have been working, this is a kind of dynamic process, so the, the Art Foundation has been working with some people advising it, saying what are some of the most realistic targets, and we have changed the surrounding municipalities from a million to 500,000. We've also changed the uh, provincial and uh, federal contributions down from two million to a million five each. And we have increased the donations from corporations and individuals across Canada and across the province. People that we know that are on our trustees that are on our foundation, people like Jim Basiles and others who uh, are quite interested in making some serious contributions to this. So this campaign is not going to be just in Owen Sound and region, uh, and uh, uh, I think the point you were trying to make that there's only so many organizations here and there's only so much money, to some extent, uh, Councilor O'Leary, we're reaching outside this community. The campaign inside the community is a relatively small part of it. And we're reaching outside as well, because this is a reach that's, that is capable of being made, and there are people there we know that will make contributions that are quite substantial. Anything else, Councilor Gregg? I do have another question here um, as well then. And uh, this goes back to, I know council supported uh, during budget. I had provided some numbers, just some data so we knew. Like I, I do like the recommendations I see here, but I personally have a hard time going to the taxpayers for $36,000 more in revenue. Now I would support the intent of council moving forward where council showed the intent to support the current budget this year and I think it's fair and and reasonable then to increase that support by 1.5 or 2 percent a year but I personally can't support an additional 36,000 coming from the taxpayer um, <coughs> for the next five years and my last question is and I asked a 22 year old university graduate this afternoon lifelong resident here in Owen Sound what matters about the art gallery to her? And she asked kind of what museum in Owen Sound are you talking about? And my question is, I mean, the, the numbers, the business plan is very, um, you know, it's very positive. But there's, how do you intend to overcome down the road with an incre a newer gallery, a bigger gallery, it seems to be that some of the other art galleries such as London and Windsor, when they expand and they rebuild, they do reach a plateau. And I know when I was in Boston last year, I went to the JFK Museum and it was wonderful. 
but I don't know if I'd go back a second time. So how do you increase or maintain relevancy to people in a newer and bigger art gallery? Well, it's, um, we have to spend a little time uh, discussing that because what it gets down to is how do you create a destination experience in an art gallery that besides the one we have, you can't do that when you expand it. Um, and first, let me just go back to the young person that you talked about. Um, part of what we're going to do is create a virtual art gallery as well, because we have to reach to younger people. Uh, this is not an elitist program here. We have to reach to young people. They're all online. And you can go right now and, and go into the Louvre and see the Louvre online. You should be able to see this gallery online. That doesn't take a whole lot of money, but it takes some know-how to do that. And then to reach out to uh, that audience, the online audience, which is a huge audience. And that's one of the things we're going to do. I didn't include it here because there's only so much time to present it, but it's in this business plan. So I think that's one of the ways that you deal with this whole issue of making sure that we have a broad cross-section of people that get interested. We have thousands and thousands of hits on our website. Many of them are for, for, for uh, young people who are studying Tom Thompson and the group of seven and so on. And we want to keep their interest going forward. To do that, you need to offer them something that's exciting, that's online, that's accessible, and lets them see some of those shows. We have shows over there that never go online because we don't have the capacity to put those shows online and to make them interactive and so on. So we're going to do that. As far as uh, are we positive here, we came to a point where we were not entirely sure that we could put a business plan in front of you that would be um, one that, that is, that is uh, as robust as this one is. And, and we had to drill down into every program that the gallery offers. There's 11 programs and build them back up again and look at what other galleries are doing in those same programs. What are they doing in the gift shop? What's the Clay Museum doing in the gift shop? It has a huge gift shop, very popular, but there's a certain way of running that gift shop. What are they doing in film programs? And so we've put this plan together from the bottom up rather than opinion down. So this is pretty much an experience generated plan that comes from other galleries, their experience, and comes from what we've been able to accomplish with the support of this council. Okay, I'm going to uh, keep moving. So we're uh, at about 40 minutes uh, on, our, on our 10 minutes with five minutes of questions. Uh, Councillor Dodd had his hand up uh, next. Oh, Councillor Thomas, okay. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, first off, I'd like to say uh, thanks to Michael and uh, Linda and Virginia and the rest of the board. Everyone's been very active on this one. Um, I've sat on the, the Art Gallery Committee here since when, this, um, no, February. So we've been able to see the progress and what it's doing, and I know you've put a lot of time into it, so I really appreciate it. Um, the one of the things you mentioned at the very beginning was regarding space. Uh, you noted that there was, um, well, anyone who's been to, to seen the, the, some of the spacing in the gallery knows that it's pretty cramped tight in there, that you're not putting more stuff anywhere else. Um, but you said there's some classification issues. I was wondering if uh, maybe yourself or Virginia or Linda, someone would be able to kind of go further into what kind of classification issues um, would be present if there isn't an expansion of the vaults or, or that? Uh, we're one of the f only a uh, few galleries uh, that are class A, uh, class A class classification of a gallery. And that has a whole lot of requirements in terms of management of the, of the collection, uh, how, the whole pro how the whole gallery is being run against a whole set of criteria. They have said to us that if we don't solve the collection issue, the collection is in the, in the basement. We have very little room left. We have an insurance issue with it down in the basement because we have a gallery beside a river. So uh, we have to have a solution within about a year from now. If we proceed with this incorporation and with a new gallery, then we're able to say this is the solution going forward. We're bringing the collection up to the first floor of the new gallery. We'll actually make it into an exhibit. But if we don't have incorporation in some way forward, that's a serious way forward, then we're going to lose that, that classification. And that means the federal and provincial governments are going to look at us and say, we don't see you qualifying for the same kind of funding as you do now, because you're in the top category of the management on uh, curatorial activity of the gallery. So we need to have a solution soon. Anything else? So further to that, so those repercussions obviously just be the financial implications that if, if we don't move forward and, and having also, that. And also, I guess if you call insurance a financial implication, we probably have some real difficulty with insurance going forward because the insurance industry is very conscious now of water and, and access to water, and we're pretty close. 
uh, to the river, obviously, and also it's in the basin. Yeah. So we have to resolve that, and we don't have a plan for it right now. We do, we, I don't think it's practical for us to say we're going to have the collection somewhere else, stored somewhere else. We need to have HVAC in there. We have to have property. It just isn't going to work. So we need a way forward that we can give to the um, <coughs> federal and provincial government to continue to have a classic uh, categorization. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Thomas. Yes, uh, thank you for your presentation, Michael. I think it's the third or fourth time and uh, is entertaining every time. Uh, I, I think this is a great idea. You know, years ago there was an attempt uh, by a group in town to uh, develop an escarpment center Ontario because there was a, uh, a recognition that we did require a big, glorious, full day, half day attraction that will bring people to our area so that some of the smaller venues could then enjoy the, uh, the spill off from that. And, and I still think that, that it's a great idea. I'm not going to be able to support the report and its recommendations as they stand tonight and I have a couple of comments on it, uh, not so much questions. I think that the report really includes two separate issues for me. Uh, one of them is incorporation and one of them is expansion. And I really feel that the two need to be separate because uh, from, a, from the council standpoint, as far as I'm concerned, the main issue for us is not the expansion. The main issue for us is the incorporation as well as the transfer of the collection and then our responsibility to the staff of the gallery. These are the key issues for us. I think that if we move forward as a council and we grant the incorporation, the expansion will be the new board's bailiwick not this council's. It's only our deal if you decide to stay a city department and then we're the ones taking the whole issue forward. So I really would have liked to have seen those two things uh, separated coming forward to council. Um, I think that uh, in terms of the, uh, the staff, it's my understanding that it could take quite some time to sort out the issue with the staff. Uh, in fact, a year or more depending on the kind of cooperation we get from the various levels uh, that need to be dealt with. And, and that's, you know, we can say anything we want. We don't really know what it's going to be. But I would like to have a, a better idea of that before we move ahead. Yeah. I think that uh, in terms of the transfer of the collection, which really, for the community, was one of the key issues uh, back last spring when, uh, when this idea first came forward, I think that Everything that I read on the transfer of the collection in the report has all of the how, but no why. Mm -hmm. And what I really, you know, the gallery refers it to, to itself in that passage as the half-century custodian of that collection, and I don't see why the gallery couldn't remain in that role and the collection remain in the ownership of the citizens of Owen Sound. Um, again, there's uh, still a... Uh, small vibrant group of former uh, board chairs who are vehemently opposed to the plan uh, specifically to the transfer of the collection so I think that that's something that that we need to take a little bit of a closer look at the final point that I have is uh, as uh, Councillor Lemon alluded I've got some serious issues with the governance structure that's proposed I think that it's not actually a hybrid board as long as six of the members are self-appointing it remains a closed board and I think that uh, a board of an institution as significant as this one needs to be more open and transparent than closed. Um, I would like to see that revisited. Uh, again, the proportions, we could discuss that. But I really have a serious issue having uh, dealt with a closed board in the past 18 months with a closed board being in charge of, uh, of what is really a beloved city organization. So with all of these questions that I have, and I know that some members of council share some of the same concerns, I'd actually like to make a motion, Your Worship. Can you hold on for one second? Because I think there's other people that probably want to comment just before we get to your motion. Sure. I'll come right back. Okay. I'm going to go yeah. to Councillor McManaman had his hand up, Councillor Wright had her hand up. <coughs> Councillor Kepke, I'm going to cut you off, sorry. And then I'll go back to uh, Councillor Thomas with his motion. Go ahead, Councillor McManaman. Thank you, Worship. And I'll be quick because Councillor Thomas spoke to many of the uh, issues I had and I believe is going to make the motion that, that I wanted to make as well, if we're on the same page here. Um, my questions would be around incorporation and expansion versus expansion. Are they mutually exclusive? Why can't one ha happen and then the other? Uh, similar to what Councillor Thomas said. 
the trust agreement again I was wondering the same thing what if the city maintained ownership of the collection anything from a certain date forward would could could go with a new entity what would be wrong about the new entity just being the custodian of the city's current collection that was another question I had um, and the last one was uh, just increasing the budget uh, that's a much bigger discussion but I think we need a lot of these things uh, uh, looked into a little more at least from the city's perspective and I think that's where Councillor Thomas is going so I'll I'll leave it at that thank you your worship thank you Councillor Wright or Deputy thank Mayor you. Wright thank you very much and thank you uh, for this presentation and and just and most of my questions have been answered but I have a few left that I I want to uh, to talk about um, you have answered the most of them but but again, uh, I don't think we can deal with the financial situation until we come to a budget. That, that's uh, one of the things. And um, the other thing is, you were here before. The, the past council, we had a list of five conditions that were set out by the previous council that our staff needs to review. That hasn't been done yet. This report speaks to every one of those, but your staff uh, would have to sit down with, with uh, the gallery board and look at those issues. For example, the Omer's issue is not quite as onerous as uh, Councillor Thomas would, uh, would, uh, would think it is. The Omer's issue gets resolved when we have a memorandum of understanding and we tell them exactly the wording that we have ch chosen. We know what that wording is. It goes to Omer's. We already have some legal opinions on that. There's a number of issues that are being raised here. I, uh, you know, we don't have time, I guess, to respond to all of them, but after a while, um, I, I think there's some issues that are being raised here that are really not, um, you know, fact-based. Right. So the Omers would be one of them. Okay. All right. Well, I'll um, wait till I hear what the motion is, and perhaps we'll move on from there. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I'll come back to Councillor Thomas. Thank you, Worship. Uh, I would move that we uh, forward this report to staff for a full report on it. Back to us. Back to us. Okay. Uh, with regard to that motion, any discussion, comments, questions? Councillor Lemon, keep it brief, please. Yeah, the one question that I'd also like in the staff report is, as we're creating a new entity, what will be its municipal tax status? Will it automatically pay no taxes, or would we have to grant that? And I'd like that included in that report. Thank you. Councillor Kepke. Thank you, Your Worship. Also, um, in the report, Regarding the expansion, I would like included in the report um, the status of the existing Bethune House, and that property is being looked at by the gallery, I be believe, as part of the expansion, if you were to expand on that site. Uh, excuse me. We, we assume that, that the Rice House is there for gallery expansion, and yeah. it's not being yeah. used now. And I'd like that included in the report as well. Thank you. I don't know, Your Worship, I don't know whether there's, it's very difficult to separate incorporation from expansion. I'd just like to comment briefly on that. We're not incorporating for the sake of incorporating. We're incorporating to access money that we can't access now. No, and that point's been made, but and we'll get it in the report. Thank you. Okay, so the motion has been made. Um, there's no further comments with regard to the motion. All in favor of that motion? And that is carried. Thank you. Thank you for your report. Thanks. Going to 9B, which is uh, Mary Ann Thomas, if she, somebody elbow war, make sure she's still awake. With regard to the Grey Bruce Pride Committee. I've been working 21 hours. 10th <laughs> anniversary, June 13th at Harrison Park. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, now for something completely different. <laughs> Good evening, Your Worship and members of Council. My name is Mary Ann Thomas. I live and work about half a block from here. I'm here this evening on behalf of Grey Bruce Pride, an organization representing the gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, transsexual, queer, questioning, intersex, and two-spirit community, as well as our families, friends, and allies. This year, we are celebrating our 10th anniversary Pride weekend with a picnic at Harrison Park on Saturday, June 13, from 3 o'clock on. 
Activities will include a performance by Richard Nechtel as Dickie Bird with Music and Magic for the Children, followed by a barbecue and a live performance by Charles Glasspool and Van Delure. Then we will move over to the Harrison Park Community Center for our first LGBT Youth Prom, an event which has been enthusiastically suggested, organized, and promoted by young people who wanted their own prom experience. On Sunday, June 14, we are hosting a movie at the Roxy called Pride at 1 p.m. All events are open to the LGBT community as well as friends, family, and allies. Admission is by donation. I would like to extend the invitation to you all to join us for all or part of the weekend. I understand the mayor has a prior commitment, but we are delighted that the deputy mayor will be bringing greetings on behalf of the city. We are pleased to have the financial support of the United Way, 92.3 The Dock, the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario, the Ontario Secondary School Teachers Found Federation, the Roxy, and many other local individuals and businesses for this event. Rest assured, we are not here looking for money. Although, if you wanted to make a donation to help defray expenses, uh, we would accommodate that. Over the past couple of months, I have been approached by community members concerned about the apparent increase of local homophobic and racist comments. As a response, along with many other community groups, Grey Bruce Pride is delighted to support Mudtown Records in their No Hate concert at the Roxy on June 27. And again, I encourage you all to attend. The City of Owen Sound supports a one day, one world festival celebrating inclusivity and diversity, which is attended mainly by school children. I'm thinking we could do a little bit more. As enshrined in our Canadian Bill of Rights and Freedoms, quote, everyone has the right to equality before the law and to equal protection of the law without discrimination because of race, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, age, or sex, end of quote. Why not affirm that Own Sound is indeed a welcoming community for everyone? Why not officially celebrate our diversity for more than one day each year? Why not, uh, you guessed it, declare our commitment by expanding our flag policy to include community groups such as Grey Bruce Pride? I would like to suggest that Own Sound's flag policy could be more generous. I suggest we could add another category of acceptable flags, that of the flag of any local community group which honours and abides by the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And I would like to suggest that the flag bracket affixed to City Hall to the left of the entrance be declared the community flag space. In fact, last year, the Miamisburg flag flew from this flag bracket for over six months even though it does not qualify under our existing flag policy. <coughs> Making this our community flag holder would in no way impinge on policies and etiquette already established for the two flagpoles. Rather, it would provide the opportunity for the City of Owen Sound to acknowledge and demonstrate that it is indeed an inclusive and diverse and welcoming community for all, because I believe that is who we are. So, in conclusion, I'm not taking anywhere near 10 minutes, <laughs> I would like to suggest the following addition to our flag policy. Quote, that City Council approve to permit flags of any local community group which honours and abides by the Canadian Charter of Rights on the community flag bracket affixed directly to City Hall. End of quote. Thank you for your time. I hope you will join us for the Pride Weekend, and I hope you will choose to amend the flag policy to demonstrate that Owen Sound is indeed an inclusive, diverse, and welcoming community. And I really hope we can make this happen so that the Grey Bruce Pride flag can be flown here for our 10th anniversary Pride Weekend, which is June 13, 14 this year. Uh, thank you. I think in, in Ottawa they would call that an omnibus uh, deputation with a whole <laughs> bunch of uh, different things. I'm uh, I still I'm figuring out whether I can get there or not. That's still a big question mark. I went a couple of years ago. Well, there's many. many I would love for there. you all to join us: staff, council, the mayor, the city. It would be great. Questions, comments. Seeing none. 
Thank you. Thank you. Next matter is uh, 9C. Oops, sorry. Wait a minute, wait a minute. We're going back to 9B. I don't have a question for Marianne, but I just wonder, she did ask us Mike, Mike. a direct question. So Mike, she did you. ask us a direct question as a part of her presentation, and I know that <laughs> we've talked about flags many times just in the few months that I've been here. But I wonder if we could uh, have a comment from either the acting city manager or the director of community services about the implications of the specific area that, that the request has been made for, the flag uh, pole on the side of the building. Through your worship, I believe Mr. Smith may have the answer to that. You got the bylaw? Go ahead. Uh, through your worship, I have the flag policy here. I uh, don't know what the implications would be, but if you'd like, uh, we could, uh, staff could prepare a report on that for council, if that's what you would request. It would appear to take an amendment of the bylaw looking at here that uh, flags flown in all, oops, sorry, you keep moving on me, uh, all city property, including parks. So that would suggest that a bylaw amendment. Is that the way, do I interpret that right? Uh, should you? Should you uh, request a uh, change to this policy, it would be taken through uh, council and then bylaw. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Councillor Lyman. Oh, sorry, Councillor Thomas, were you done? I'm, I'm jumping. Uh, can we have that report? Uh, do we need a motion for that? Yeah. I would move that we have a report from uh, city staff on the possibility of amending the flag policy. And then it goes to bylaw committee. Okay. Wherever it goes. Um, going to go to Councillor Lemon next. Well, uh, just looking at it, I hadn't thought of it till the presentation, and there's a big hole in this uh, where it allows the Canadian flag, no problem, city flag. But one of the ones that are missing, uh, we own the land at the Tom Thompson, yet quite regularly they uh, fly the RCF, RCAF flag. At the Bishop, you mean? At the Bishop, sorry, at the Bishop. And I think this should be amended to include Canadian, accredited Canadian military flags. So, so it's something to be reviewed. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go this and Because one. we're already violating this under what's been going on. Uh, who was down there? I saw a couple of hands went up. Uh, Councillor Gregg? Okay, Councillor McManaman. Thank you, Worship. I won't be supporting the motion as a member of council that sat through the weeks and weeks and months of debate and um, uh, hard feelings, I guess I'll call them in the community over this issue. I think it's one that's been decided and should be left that way. That's my opinion. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay, to uh, um, Councillor Thomas's motion, which was to have the policy reviewed at bylaw committee, which will then come back to council. All in favor? Just a question. Uh, the yeah. Finley Amendment to also look at the status of the military flag at the same time. Thank you. So that's the Finley Amendment. Yeah, that, that's fine. I thought it was fairly open, what the motion was anyway, which would have allowed that, but that, that clarifies it. Okay, to that motion, all in favor? One, two, three, opposed? One, two, three, four, five. It is defeated. Okay. Um, to 9C then which is the next depu deputation, which is recognizes uh, some people with regard to our winter water crisis of 2015. So I'll go down to the uh, podium. Actually, if I can call up maybe as a group, uh, Gail Graham and David Johnstone, is he? Yep, both here. Dave Bosco, Bill Henry. Come on up. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm giggling. Poor, uh, poor Dave here gets accused of looking like somebody, and I don't get it, but uh, <laughs> do you want to try the chain on? <laughs> 
So the city's 2015 winter water crisis started in February and lasted into April. The past few months have not been an easy time for our city, but the cooperation and help of many people and businesses, we were able to work through the challenges. Tonight, on behalf of Council, I have the privilege of acknowledging the various groups, businesses and individuals that assisted city residents to successfully get through the 2015 winter water crisis. I'd like to start by recognizing the citizens of Owen Sound, those of you that supported your neighbors during the critical time. Thank you for your com community spirit and incredible patience. Demonstrates what makes Owen Sound, what, Owen Sound such a great place to live. You know, as we all know, we had citizens that went for up to a month without water, and we had, they had friends that uh, helped them do their laundry, uh, helped, them, helped them use their showers, do various things to help those people to get through that. 329, I think, houses, 320 plus houses that went without water, and I'm aware of three or four complaints at City Hall out of 320 houses four complaints, and some of them were excitable people that were very satisfied uh, once they got help, but that's, that's a remarkable statement about our community, that we look after each other when, the, when times are tough, that we, uh, that we pull together, but the fact that when there really is a serious, serious uh, issue, they don't really complain about it. They dig in and, uh, and they get through it. The crisis also demonstrated why positive media relationships are so important within the community. The various media outlets in Owen Sound and region helped to get the important messages out to the public in a timely manner, which helped to mitigate the effects of the emergency. Thank you for your professionalism, and they're all outside. I, I recall one Sunday uh, coming in and contacting people as we put out a press release to the media uh, about keeping your taps running because we're worried about more, fl uh, more pipes freezing. And uh, there was a press release uh, went out on all the media outlets within five or 10 minutes, maybe 20 minutes, and we're getting phone calls to, uh, to answer questions. And uh, it was amazing and we really are lucky in this community with the media that we have. Harold Sutherland Construction, E.C. King Construction, McDonnell Construction, and GM Blue Plan. Thank you for long days and nights that you spent working alongside our city staff to provide temporary services, the repair of broken water mains. We could not have accomplished what we did without your assistance. The city staff from various uh, divisions and departments such as not limited to our water and wastewater and public works div divisions, finance, IT, community services department, Thank you for all your extra hours and work that you put in. Your dedication and commitment to the citizens and businesses of the City of Owen Sound went above and beyond. We've gotten so many positive, uh, so much positive feedback about the water crew and the people uh, working with businesses to go in early in the morning and not interrupt their businesses so they could uh, continue to uh, keep the doors open and it was greatly appreciated. I'd like to thank and acknowledge our Director of Operations and Becking for working long hours to find ways to solve the issues as they arose and keeping council up to date during the crisis, providing uh, daily information to some of us and uh, keeping the press informed and, um, and answering questions as people did send in their, their questions to uh, City Hall. You had answers out within hours, if, if not minutes, that uh, then we're getting feedback after from people how thankful they were for your response to them. At this time, I'd like to recognize the contributions of three businesses that demonstrate their commitment to the community through donation of resources and services. Gail Graham and David Johnson, representing the YMCA Owen Sound and Grey Brews for allowing residents to use the Y showers and supplying potable water. To Dave Bosco and staff, owner-operator of the water store for supplying potable water and for Bill Henry, who was uh, out of the country for a while and is back, and his uh, family and staff at the Owen Sound Water Depot for also supplying jugs of potable water. We have uh, certificates of recognition for each of you. We really, words do not say enough for how much we appreciate, and the city appreciates the things that, uh, that each of you has done. I better make sure I get these right, left. There we go. 
again, thanks to everyone that, uh, that got us through this, and especially you guys that bypassed and profits or, or memberships. Maybe you made some extra memberships, but it was greatly appreciated, everything that you guys uh, did for us. Thank you. Moving on in the agenda, going to public question period. Is there anyone that has a question to ask? No? Okay, thank you. Going on to number 11, which is correspondence received to which direction of council is required. First one, 11A, is correspondence from the Government of Canada with regard to nominations for the Prime Minister's Volunteer Award. Deputy Mayor Wright. Can we send that off to the Recreation uh, Committee? And that's your motion? Yes. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you. 11B, correspondence from Vinothina Hedgendran, Minister, I should know that better, shouldn't I? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing with regard to municipal delegations at AMO Conference. And I think it provides us with a form to fill out. Uh, Councillor McManaman. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. At the last meeting, we discussed talking to the Minister of Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing about, uh, about our uh, frozen pipe situation. Perhaps this is the opportunity to request a delegation. Um, if we haven't, uh, uh, has a letter been sent yet? And have we heard back? I'm assuming probably no, the, not. The, I apologize. The letter is in my file to be edited and it's I'm just wondering if we should add, well, send that letter, but we could also send in a request to meet here as well. Yeah, I think there's an actual it. form that we fill out uh, for this. Um, go ahead, Deputy Mayor Wright. Uh, I, um, I would like to see us get a meeting with him earlier if we could. Yeah. And if we can't get that early meeting with him, then of course get to him at AMO. Um, I forget, is there a deadline of when we have to have this in? Through you, Your Worship, I believe it says July 6th. So might I suggest that should council have uh, any delegations that they would like to meet with, they send it to the clerk's office. The clerks will compile that list and then send one form in. So what I might ask uh, council to do is raise it uh, at your committees if there's anything uh, particular there where you're in some ways a little closer to the issue and then we'll bring it back to uh, council or, or just provide it to staff to be uh, Add it and we'll send the, the form in. Um, so do I need to receive that? We should. So motion to receive, Councillor McManaman receiving that correspondence. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Uh, we're over to reports 12A. 12A1 is a, a verbal report from Manager of Revenue with regard to the 2015 tax policy. get you to hit the button on the microphone so we can hear you. Okay. Robin, have you been here before on a council night? I can't remember. I'll get you yeah. to state who you are and what your position is just to reintroduce yourself just in case anyone needs Robin to Robin Malong, Manager of Revenue. There we go. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, through you, Your Worship, I'd like to provide a summary of the 2015 tax policy that was presented at the last Financial Advisory Committee meeting. Um, I'm just going to start with a bit of background. Um, there are two fundamental points that must be kept in mind when developing tax policy. Oops, didn't want to do that. Policies do not change the overall amount of levy to be collected. And for every tax reduction, there must be an equivalent tax increase. Our levy requirements for 2015 have now been determined and the city can go forward with implementing the tax policies. 
The city must levy $26,428,867 to support the 2015 budget. We must satisfy a county requisition of $7,693,717. And the edu education rates have now been set by the province. The Municipal Act sets out the parameters to be followed by municipalities when set, setting property tax policies. And these parameters include establishing tax ratios and discounts, our optional classes, our capping options, and various other tax mitigation measures. Our tax ratios, um, starting with tax ratios, just a quick definition. A tax ratio defines the municipal tax rate of each property class in relation to the residential rate. So for example, if your commercial ratio is two, that means your commercial municipal tax rate will be two times that of the residential rate. Uh, the recommended scenario that was supported by council at the April 27th meeting continues with the plan to align with the county ratios by 2021, but flowing a more modest um, reduction through to the commercial class. And the reason for this was we wanted to keep the, the impact on the residential class to less than 3%. This following table uh, demonstrates the net levy change summary, and it's the tax change summary from 2014 to 2015. Um, there's an increase in the residential tax class of 2.59%, in the commercial 1.43, a reduction in the industrial by 1.46, the large industrial is being reduced by 3.51, and the multi-res is increased by 1.5. Um, I, would, I would like to mention that the average single family dwelling we'll see a $70 increase in 2015. This pie chart illustrates, illustrates each tax class share of the 2015 total levy. So 59% of the levy is being absorbed by the residential class, 25.7% by the commercial, 11.2 by the multi res and 3.5 by the industrial. And finally, on the last slide, um, the mandatory capping parameters. In 1998, there was a province-wide mandatory capping program that was put into place to mitigate assessment-related property tax changes on the multi-res, the commercial, and the industrial properties. Recommended for 2015 is the continuation of the following parameters for these property tax classes. These parameters are the most favorable to accelerate to the CVA class. And currently for 2015, we only have one property remaining in the, in the commercial class that is, that's capped. Sorry, and quick, so, sorry, CBA? CBA tax means that they're at full um, current value assessment. Current value assessment, thank yeah. you. And that concludes my presentation. Hmm. Questions? Council McManaman, I keep seeing that hand get I just think it's important. Uh, Ms. Malone, could you go over what, so again, what the residential and commercial uh, increases are this year? The residential and commercial, the total tax levy increase, the residential is 2.59%. That's blended, that's county, city, education. And the commercial, 1.43%. And industrial's down between 1.5% and 3.5%. Yes, it is. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Wright. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. That was probably one of the best <laughs> presentations on tax capping, CVA, et cetera, that we, this council has received. So thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and the part that I like about it, when I get to the Finance Committee in a while, I don't have to cover that one. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, motion to receive, uh, Councillor Gregg. All in favor? Carried. Thank you. 
Uh, 12A2 is report from Director of Operations with regard to serving, servicing strategy for Sydenham Heights Secondary Planning Area. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, if Mr. Smith could put up the, uh, the plan that appears at the end of the report, please, that'll help me speak to, uh, to a number of the issues that we need to discuss this evening. There we go. Okay. Um, your Worship, members of Council, uh, the Sydenham Heights uh, Secondary Planning Area has actually been in existence uh, going back into the late 1980s. Um, the uh, area is generally speaking uh, bounded by uh, 16th Street East, uh, southerly to uh, 6th Street East, and uh, from uh, just west of 16th Avenue uh, to 28th Avenue. Um, the secondary planning area is intended to uh, provide and meet the needs for housing uh, up to the 2026 uh, time horizon and represents uh, something in the order of 13, uh, 1,350 or, or thereabouts number of units um, that will, will satisfy the uh, growth projection from the official plan. Um, as you're aware, some portions of the, uh, of the planning area have already been developed. Uh, we're, of course, all familiar with Walmart, Home Depot, uh, and the de development across the Heritage uh, uh, Grove area. So uh, what we're talking about is having to, uh, to look at the development of uh, the balance of the area as well as uh, the areas uh, south of uh, 8th Street East. Um, Council will also recall that you recently passed the development charges bylaw, uh, a component of which was a area-specific development charge that was intended to fund the, uh, the uh, extension of trunk services into the area in order to um, provide the, the framework and the groundwork necessary for the area to develop. Um, with the OP policies now in place, the development charges policies in place. Council's next uh, step is to, is to look at how to uh, facilitate development into, uh, into the area. Um, the critical issue at this point is how do we, how do we provide those trunk services uh, that will be needed for those, uh, those lands to be developed. Um, the overall uh, servicing strategy um, is uh, broken down into uh, the two phases. Um, the first, phase one is intended to obviously go first um, and to um, be serviced in terms of water by uh, the extension of trunk services along the 8th Street corridor uh, to a point about where the 20th, future 20th Avenue uh, will come through. Um, in terms of, of current physical features, uh, extending the water main from the East Hill Reservoir at the crown of uh, land on 8th Street just to the east of uh, 9th Avenue, uh, easterly uh, to beyond where the hospital uh, property currently is uh, finished. So we're, we're coming in from, uh, from the west and to extend uh, sanitary sewage services up from 16th Street uh, southerly to, uh, to uh, uh, 6th Street along the uh, Telfer uh, Creek uh, corridor. Um, so uh, the, the uh, lines that I'm speaking to are the red line that runs diagonally through the middle of, the, uh, uh, through the middle of that slide. And uh, as I said, the uh, water is coming in from the, uh, from the west along 8th Street. The uh, other component of, of the servicing strategy has to do with stormwater management. Uh, that will be done on a, on a site-specific basis, um, utilizing the natural uh, water courses that, uh, that run through the area, uh, Telfer Creek being uh, the most prominent of those. And it, it's indicated by that large slash of, of uh, olive green uh, that again runs diagonally through the, uh, the middle of the slide. Um, the challenge now is to decide uh, uh, how to 
initiate uh, this development. Um, in, in most conventional uh, development scenarios where you've got, um, you've got services at one location, it is typically done by extension. So you, uh, you extend the, your services, the land then becomes open for development, it develops, that generates the revenues through various uh, DC charges and front ending agreements to allow further extensions and, and uh, the land is, is developed sequentially. Unfortunately, that can't be the scenario in this particular instance because as I've explained, the, uh, the sanitary sewage has to come from the north and the water has to come from the west. So what it means is that those services have to be extended through those properties in order for the land to then be able to be developed. The decision before council is the uh, how to to um, uh, facilitate that to happen, and the degree to which uh, council sees the city being involved as a proponent and a, a supporter and and uh, frankly a driver of uh, of the development. Um, we have the added complication uh, in our own particular circumstances in that we have a developer who is uh, located uh, south of 8th Street uh, who is in a position uh, to proceed subject to the availability of trunk, uh, trunk, sewer, uh, trunk services. Uh, so um, council has to, if, if we are to spur on the development in this area, Council's, I think, going to have to take a, uh, a more prominent role in the development than would, would traditionally be the case in some other jurisdictions or, or marketplaces. Um, in terms of, of um, costs, we're looking at having to, as an absolute minimum, uh, construct a uh, sanitary sewer from uh, 16th Street East to 8th Street East and the extension of the water main uh, as I've said from its current termination around 16th Avenue through to the far side of the hospital. Um, in terms of costs we're looking at something in the order of a, a million five to construct the sanitary component and a probably a, uh, something in the order of a further four hundred thousand dollars to address the uh, water component. In order to uh, move this initiative forward, we have uh, identified a um, program uh, that we would like Council's uh, permission to proceed upon. Uh, it starts with uh, the pre preparation of a land budget. And what this will do is it will identify the uh, proportionate shares that each uh, benefiting property must contribute in order to facilitate the uh, payment of these trunk services. Um, our second step then would be to sit down and meet with these benefiting property owners to assess uh, their willingness to proceed at the current time and um, whether or not they are in a position to develop at all at this time. On the basis of, of uh, the outcome of those meetings, we would then come back to you with a, uh, a more detailed plan of attack as to how to facilitate the construction of these trunk services. Uh, once we have Council's uh, blessing on that plan, the next step would be to uh, go through a Class EA process as required under the Environmental Assessment Act to clear the way for, for the uh, design. Uh, that would then be followed up by land acquisition because currently uh, the land is um, held in private hands and would ultimately have to be uh, converted into public lands in order for the construction of the works. And then um, finally we could then proceed to construction. Um, and uh, depending again on the degree to which the private sector may be in a position to move forward or not, that will dictate what the most appropriate strategy uh, to, be to be pursued 
um, in terms of both the, the city's uh, involvement as well as that of the private sector. Uh, we are aware of some funds uh, that ha could be committed from some of the private sector involved in this proposal. Uh, staff have also identified something in the order of $380,000 of funds currently in reserve that could be brought to bear to fund uh, some of these works. So um, we're, uh, we're uh, looking for council's uh, uh, direction in terms of how you wish to proceed that is a summary your worship of uh, a very large subject I'll uh, I'd be happy to try and answer questions as best I can given the unknowns that we're facing thank councillor McManaman had his hand up first thank you your worship and I uh, enthusiastically support this recommendation and this plan of attack when this area became part of the city in 1987 um, this was going to be our growth area and by and large other than some work along uh, 16th Street, uh, it hasn't developed. It hasn't happened. It's been sitting there waiting to develop. Why doesn't it develop? Everybody, you know, we all want Owen Sound to grow. Everybody wants it to grow. Well, why hasn't that happened? And the reason um, is because sometimes you have to spend money to make money. When we, this, uh, during the development charges debate, um, one of the developers said, traditionally what has happened, as Mr. Becking explained, if somebody wanted water or sewer there, they could pay for the whole thing. And uh, even, if, even if they only owned one piece of parcel of land, they were paying for all of it. They had to upfront those costs. And during the development charges debate, one of the, uh, one of the uh, owners uh, in this area said, you want me to pay all the money upfront? Well, what's the city going to do? What's the city doing to facilitate this? And you know, it was, you know, right then, that was a, a moment for me where I kind of went, geez, that, that's a very good point. We expect the developer to put all their private money in What's the city's skin in the game, if, if that's the correct term? So um, however you worded it, and Mr. Becking had several words there, uh, we facilitate development, we're a driver for development, we're spurring on development, whatever, however you want to put that, this is an, in, an essential piece for the future of Own Sound, as far as I'm concerned. A um, Couple of specific questions for, for Mr. Becking. Uh, the first one, you talked about the sewer going through the Telford Creek area. Would the water line, is it, the water main would be the intent that that would go on the under the road or would it be in uh, you know just off the road I'm, I'm just wondering does Con this involve tearing the entire roadway up is what I'm getting at conceptually um, the extension of the services through the what I'll call virgin territory for all practical purposes has has been identified in a conceptual sense um, one of the next steps is to to nail that down um, one of two things would have to happen. Either it would have to follow proposed road allowances, or in the alternative, it would have to follow a designated corridor. And those are, that's one of the many, many, many questions and, and issues that we will have to face um, as we move this initiative forward. But based on everything that we've done thus far and there you know it, it's not that we're flying totally blind here because there has been a master servicing study completed um, it forms the basis or the framework that will allow s council to move forward uh, to to uh, take this from simply lines on a page to to uh, actual fruition um, and and we can move those forward but at the end of the day regardless of whether it's in a, a formal road allowance or a utility corridor, that land must be held in public in the public name. So that's, that's how we're, we'd have to move forward. And, ju and just to be clear, because <clears throat> we did discussion years ago about a water tower in this area, for this particular phase, I guess we'll call it that, mm -hmm. there is no water tower required. The analysis that uh, was done uh, as part of the master servicing study initially found that there was insufficient capacity for a variety of reasons uh, and did recommend a tower. Subsequent analysis, however, has indicated that phase one of the two-phase development can occur without an elevated tower. There will be sufficient water and there will be water of sufficient pressure to be able to, to move forward. And that will then delay the requirement for the for the elevated tower to somewhere beyond 20 say tw between 2023 20, and 2026 depending on of course on the on the rate of development right 
And my uh, last question, uh, you didn't just, sorry, second last question, you didn't discuss timeline. And I know there's a number of nego negotiations that have to take place here and a lot of work still need to be done. Are we talking a 20, uh, just to give everyone the sense, a 2015, a 2016, a 2017 discussion? What are we, what are we looking at, roughly? I would suggest that we're probably looking at somewhere between three and six months to get through this initial consultation, if you will, with the, uh, with the development community. Um, more likely three than six, but I'll hedge my bet a little bit. Um, a Class EA will likely take the better part of six months, assuming that there are no major objections. Um, and, you know, uh, I would prefer to hope for the best and plan for the worst on this. Um, design could be done relatively quickly. I'm thinking three to six months at the outside. So we could have this land ready for, for developers to move in and start building houses and, and the local infrastructure, my guess is late in 17, uh, 2017 or, or early 2018 at, okay. at the latest. But again, that, there's all that's, manner that's of things that could uh, send us off and awry. But no, that's, that's good. And I realize I'm asking you sort of, there's a, it's a moving target, but that's, I was just trying to get a sense yeah. so we didn't, um, you know, people are thinking this is happening in 2015. It's a long-term process. I would, I would say two years is a, is a minimum target. Uh, two and a half to three is a more practical. Right. And I, would, and I, do, I do want to congratulate staff that when we raised this at budget time, uh, talking about this servicing this area and what it might look like, and so I, I want to congratulate staff for uh, moving this along in a timely fashion. So, Your Worship, I'll be happy to move the rec recommendation that we uh, support uh, the next steps as outlined in this report. Good, thank you. I'm going to go to Councillor Thomas next. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Councillor McManaman pretty much said everything, I think, that, uh, that I was thinking, so I'll keep it very brief. Uh, I have no hesitation supporting this. Uh, I think that it's an idea that's long overdue. Uh, I happened to be working in the media in 1987 and was at the signing ceremony when this land was annexed. So it has been a long time coming, uh, getting, this, uh, getting this organized because at that time a lot of big dreams were expressed for this piece of property vis-a-vis uh, -vis Owen Sound's future. Uh, it's probably too early to talk about a, an extension to the development charges holiday, Councillor McManaman, but uh, I have no hesitation in supporting it. Um, in terms of the motion we're being asked to support tonight, is there a financial implication to that? Your Worship, uh, through you, I, I would say at this point it's, it's staff time. And of course, council's already dealt with the, the budget. Um, we are uh, going to need to elicit uh, the assistance of Mr. Scanlon. Uh, we believe that that will be a relatively modest amount of money, and I'm, I'm going to say something under $10,000 for his services to help with the, the land budget, which frankly is a critical component of it. Uh, if we don't get that one right um, from the onset, we, uh, we will find ourselves uh, spinning our wheels. Um, other than that, I think to get us through sort of the next, I'll say six months, uh, requires no uh, budget commitment or change to the, the current year's budget um, at this time. If there are any other implications, we'll bring them to your attention as they arise. Okay, thank you for that uh, information. And uh, I just want to close by saying that if there was any, any question out there in the wider world about whether this council is serious about creating new possibilities for Owen Sound, certainly bringing this forward at this time following the development charges holiday has got to cement that idea out there in the public. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lyman. Yeah, one question. In, in terms of if you're, say, extending the trunk sewer, which starts at Highway 20, well, it doesn't start at Highway 26, but we construct from Highway 26 in the southerly, southerly direction, question that I have, if say you have three property owners and A and C are willing to contribute at this time, but B doesn't want to, can we hold B's feet to the fire that when he does develop, and develop he will pay his apportionment of that cost? That's 
Question one. Yes, there are a number of mechanisms that can be used. Um, a lot of it, quite frankly, you've already put in place through the OP and, uh, and through the DC charge bylaw. Um, there will have to be front-ending agreements uh, to ensure that there's an appropriate uh, sharing of costs and uh, in a proportion to the benefits that are, are accruing. Um, there are a number of strategies that, that can be brought to bear, can be brought to bear if we need to, um, but I'm hoping that, uh, that uh, we can get, the, uh, get every round, everyone around the table and, and have uh, uh, people uh, be prepared to, to lend a hand to one degree or another. That's what I would hope, but I, I as you said earlier, plan for the worst. Absolutely. And the other question I've got in terms of uh, the, uh, that area, uh, would we do it selectively or, in other words, moving it out? Like the sanitary sewer from, I call it the Walmart cutoff, the area behind Walmart. Uh, there's no water there unless we bring it up, I assume, from uh, 8th Street. Um, there is water uh, available that can service down uh, closer to 16th Street. Um, I think what you'll see is the water will, the primary source of water comes from the East Hill Reservoir right. pumping station. And it will be the primary driver both north and south of, of 8th Avenue, or 8th Street, sorry. Uh, 16th Street, there is supply there and we will be able to drive it southerly. Um, to a degree, but at some point that, that link between the, the, the stuff that's coming north and the, the pipe that's coming south, that link has to be closed. So um, uh, that will, will uh, be done as part of the ongoing development of those properties. The um, sanitary sewer, unfortunately, we have to build the, the entirety of the, the, uh, the sewer from Highway 26 or 16th Street to 8th Street as an absolute minimum uh, in order to, to uh, get um, those properties in a position where they can move forward. Um, now, Council has also done, uh, whether you realize it or not, the Council has also done some very smart things in the last several years. Case in point, the 3rd Avenue reconstruction that's presently being, uh, is presently underway. That that reconstruction of that sanitary sewer, in fact, alleviates one of the other roadblocks to the development in this area because it creates the additional capacity between uh, East Bayshore Road and the sewage treatment plant. So all of that has contributed to now putting us in a position where we can move forward. Um, and in the same fashion with the water, uh, there was a number of upgrades that had to be made to both the reservoir, the East Hill Reservoir and the East Hill Booster Pumping Station. Those works were done in, in uh, 2013 and 2014. That work is now in place, so again, it removes that, that, uh, that roadblock that was hampering uh, expansion of this development area. Thank you. And uh, thank you. I, I too share a great desire to see this happen as I was on council my first term when this land was annexed, and we all expected it would develop tomorrow. I guess tomorrow is 2015. Good. Thank you, Councillor, sorry, Deputy Mayor Wright. Oh, I'm not gonna repeat everything. I'm just glad that it's going forward. I support it 100%. I wish it was sooner. We'll make it happen as quickly as we can, Your Worship. Councillor Kepke. Thank you, Your Worship. I too am very pleased to see this coming forward and also pleased to hear that no, the God. planning stages won't take that long to get in place. Um, the front ending costs yeah. that you talked about, is this a program that may be similar to our old local improvement program where developers in that area can pay back over so many years the costs related to that? Typically the, the way it's done is it's credit against the development charge, future development charges. So essentially it works in a very similar fashion. Uh, the source of money is just a different different source, that's all. Okay. Anyone else? 
I can recall being an operations committee. Uh, I'm not even sure I was on council yet, and we were talking about putting up the water tower, and then uh, Mr. Prentice coming back with a new plan of upping some uh, pumps up around the reservoir, and I think, as you say, that went in a couple of years ago. And that's getting to be three, four, five years ago that we made that decision, moved it ahead, waited for enough budget to be able to get it done. And uh, so we have chipped away at this, and it's great to be sitting here uh, knowing that we're going to go ahead the next few years and get that opened up. So uh, Councilor McManaman had a motion, um, which was moving the recommendation. All in favor? That is carried. Great. Thank you. Uh, next one is Mr. Becking again, I think 12A3, which is the wastewater treatment plan upgrade 2015 first quarter report. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, if I could ask Mr. Smith to uh, um, pull up, uh, I think it's about the second slide. Uh, it's the one that's the picture with the numbers on it, Jeff. Well, oh, right there. Okay. Um, Your Worship, members of council. Um, I just wanted to uh, deliver the third um, third quarterly report <coughs> since the start of the uh, of the project. Um, Mr. Prentice would uh, would have been here, except that uh, he uh, decided to take a little bit of holiday. Uh, uh, well deserved one, by the way. Um, in the uh, in the first quarter of the year, um, we've seen. Uh, I will say some trials and tribulations and also some successes. Um, the winter was not kind upon us and, um, and so as a consequence the contractor was, uh, was delayed. Um, as I will demonstrate uh, later on in the presentation, we're sitting at uh, a total delay at the present time of about 28 days. So that's a 28, 28 day pushback on, on the final completion date, but nonetheless, um, and, and in spite of the, uh, of the uh, less than ideal uh, conditions, uh, the contractor uh, was able to make good progress. Um, the main area of activity was at the biosolids uh, storage tank, which is uh, seven, uh, facility 7A on that, uh, that diagram you see before you. Um, that uh, storage tank uh, is now uh, constructed and is being uh, tested. Uh, that having been said, the various delays and whatnot has resulted in the contractor missing his uh, interim completion date. Um, in short, that I don't see that that will have a serious adverse effect at this point in time in terms of the overall completion. However, if we are to mitigate that, it means that we have to uh, get the contractor to make some adjustments in terms of his critical path uh, to um, critical path schedule so that he can, he can absorb that, that loss and still deliver the project more or less on time and uh, hopefully on budget. Uh, work was also done uh, in the uh, in terms of the uh, chemical storage building, which was is uh, just uh, to the water side of the clarifiers, which is item three uh, on the plan. Um, he was able to get in and do some excavation work uh, for the bath, uh, and that in fact is now almost 90% complete and I'm happy to report that we did not as yet encounter any further contaminated soils. So we, we still remain in, a, in good condition in that regard. Uh, the other area of focus uh, for the uh, contractor was the uh, digester support building which is um, item six on the, uh, on the plan. Uh, that, that structure is now up out of the ground um, and the contractor is installing piping and, and uh, pumps in the building, uh, which is a, good, uh, is, is a good move forward. The final area of uh, significant activity is in the uh, switchgear uh, building, which would be item eight, uh, just to the north of um, the, the biosolid storage tank. 
uh, where the contractor, uh, we encountered some very severe um, soils conditions that required the redesign of the foundations for that, that particular building. Uh, it did result in some additional costs uh, over and above what was anticipated, but they were, uh, it was the most expedient way to deal with the, uh, the conditions that were encountered. Uh, Jeff, could I get you to, to uh, drop down and um, so in, in summary then um, we've done uh, the contractors done a lot of earthworks um, on the site we've uh, exposed the bath excavation uh, we've got the um, dechlorination uh, system that was uh, approved by council that has now been uh, put in place and we're uh, and we've got that tweaked to the point where uh, we're meeting uh, the federal objectives. Um, as I've said, the tank uh, is for the most part complete, uh, despite some difficulties with the, uh, a number of the plates uh, and the weather conditions. Uh, in terms of environmental protection plan, um, we continue to have regular consultations with SOAN. Uh, and they are uh, more than pleased with the efforts that have been put forward by the contractor in terms of meeting our obligations with, uh, with respect to environmental compliance and, and, uh, and environmental uh, uh, protection of the, uh, of the adjoining waters. Next slide, please, Jeff. Um, health and safety, uh, we've had a, a few minor uh, uh, incidents but nothing of any great significance. The Ministry of Labor uh, visits the site on a regular basis. Uh, that is quite normal. Um, and they are, uh, they are pleased and satisfied with the efforts that have, have been put forward by the contractor. Um, and, and as I said, that's fundamentally a good and healthy thing. I would far rather have the Ministry of Labor there every second week than uh, show up every six months and then have have uh, difficulties. Um, in terms of the impact on the adjoining property owners, uh, things have, uh, have gone well. Uh, the contractors did work on, on weekends and some extended hours. That having been said, it was done in a way that was, they were notified, they were aware of it, um, they mitigated it to the extent that they could, and generally speaking, the feedback from the, from the uh, general public has been positive. We're in mud season at the present time, um, and uh, so the, we've been uh, on the contractor to make sure that we're keeping things uh, as clean as possible uh, in the circumstances. With respect to schedule, as I've indicated, we're presently about 28 days um, behind the, the schedule as originally proposed, um, and the contractor did miss his interim completion date. That said, uh, we do not have a basis for the assessment of liquidated damages. We have sat down with the contractor and, and between uh, all of us we have identified areas where we can, um, we can uh, change our approach to how things were, are, are proposed to be done. And by doing so, that will um, free up uh, time, which will allow us to move forward um, and hopefully gain back some of the lost time that we've experienced as a result predominantly of uh, to weather. In terms of uh, finance, uh, Jeff, if you could move on. Um, we're, uh, we're in good shape. We're still within uh, parameters, and I'll show you a graph here um, momentarily that will uh, highlight the fact that, that we still remain uh, well within uh, the established parameters. Um, but we are continuing to absorb additional costs and we're trying to uh, manage that to the extent that we can. Um, by and large, the performance of all the partners in the, in the group have, have been very good. Uh, we have had a couple of hiccups along the way, um, but uh, to the credit of all parties involved, we've managed to work our way through them uh, with uh, little or no impact on the city. So. Uh, again, I remain cautiously optimistic that uh, uh, we're making good progress there. Um, and if I could get Jeff to, we'll just run through a few of the photographs. 
uh, keep going. Uh, these charts just indicate the uh, uh, performance indicators and, and as I say, uh, by and large everything is fine. Um, so moving uh, clockwise from the upper left, uh, you're seeing the foundations of the uh, biosolid storage building. Uh, moving clockwise to the right, uh, that blue sea can is the, uh, is the uh, uh, dechlorination uh, system. Uh, it, council may recall that uh, we had thought that there may be some salvage value uh, to that because the, uh, the dechlorination process is only required as long as we continue to be on, on a primary treatment plant. Uh, when we convert to secondary treatment and use U UV disinfection, uh, that dechlorination system will no longer be required. The contractor has, has uh, uh, made us an offer um, and, uh, and we'll be considering that and, and uh, counter-offering, shall we say. Um, the uh, lower right is the pipe gallery uh, in the tunnel. Um, and the, the brown pipes that you see there are some of the new pipes that are being installed. And in the, uh, in the lower left is the installation of the temporary power uh, line that was brought in to facilitate the works. Next. Um, again, starting at the upper left-hand corner, um, you're seeing the, uh, the foundations uh, for the digester support building. Um, that wood planking that's in the background is actually uh, soldier piles and lagging that are needed to provide uh, temporary support to the associate, uh, the buildings on either side uh, of it uh, so that we didn't uh, have any collapses. Um, and needless to say, we didn't. Um, everything worked quite well. Um, I have to comment uh, that notwithstanding the poor winter weather conditions that we've experienced, the quality of the concrete work has been superb. Um, among some of the best I've seen in, in my career. Um, next, Jeff. Um, the, I made mention of the uh, switchgear uh, building. Uh, in the upper left corner, uh, you see the, uh, the ductwork coming into the area where the, uh, the foundation for the, uh, the building is, is uh, being placed. Um, uh, Simply put, it's a spaghetti factory of, of, uh, of ducts and, and uh, whatnot, all of which ultimately end up being concrete encased in, uh, in the foundation. Uh, as I indicated, the, the soil conditions were, uh, were very poor uh, for the purposes of piling, so uh, we ended up having to go to a, a uh, engineered earth or engineered fill solution that was more expensive. Uh, but I'm satisfied that it was the only solution that was a, appropriate in the circumstances. Um, if you get rid of the wires, uh, you've got an excellent picture in the upper right of a UFO. Um, and uh, that's, in fact, the top for the uh, biosolid storage tank being lifted in place. Are you sure? Yes, I am. Um, and, uh, and again, you can see uh, the, uh, in the lower two photographs, how the, uh, the, the tank was uh, sort of raised up from the ground. In fact, what they did was they put the top on and then jacked uh, the, uh, the tank up as the, the walls increased. Next. And then there's some aerial shots that uh, give you an indication of the amount of progress that we're making. Uh, next. Um, I won't even begin to think that I can go through and explain all of this uh, in any detail in the time allowed, but suffice it to say that the red uh, tasks are on a critical path. Those are the things that are really critical if we're going to be able to achieve the overall schedule. So uh, those are the areas where the contractor is going to focus his efforts and uh, we'll be adjusting those through the uh, negotiations. Next. Um, that gives you a, that table gives you a summary of the uh, of the adjustments to the schedule that have been approved. We've been approving them ongoingly as as opposed to uh, uh, allowing them to build up so that there's a everyone has a very clear understanding of expectations. Next, 
Um, this graph shows you where we are relative to, uh, to plan in terms of finances. Uh, Jeff, if you can just flip down to the bottom of that because we're still down in the lower 20% of the, of the project. Uh, what you'll see there is that there has been an expansion of scope as a result of extras, uh, but we're still within the, uh, the parameters that were set out initially for the project. Uh, the other, uh, I think, salient point here is the fact that the con contractor, uh, because of his delays, um, is falling off track in terms of the, the original plan. But again, through uh, our negotiations, we'll get him to start providing additional resources uh, to get us back on track. Um, and so I think in the next couple of months, you'll see uh, um, those graphs will st to con tend to converge again. Next. And this is just a blow up of, of that uh, earlier chart at the, at the bottom end. The consulting engineer's uh, cost, the purple is uh, his planned approach, the blue is his current status. Uh, he's been absorbing higher than uh, normal or average costs. Uh, that's to be expected given the state of the uh, project because a lot of your uh, shop drawings and so forth are, are early on. So you're going to be putting a lot more office time and a lot more engineering effort in earlier and then that will tail off as, as it becomes more focused on field operations. Uh, so I think you'll see that, that uh, those two curves come back together. I think that should be about it. Um, Your Worship, if there are any questions from members of Council. Any uh, quick questions? Just, um, just keep everybody in mind, it's uh, 10 after 9 and we've got one heck of a, I think, agenda still to go through. So, uh, Councillor Dodd. Uh, just a quick question. Since the last time we've had one of these reports, I guess we've found something quite significant in the waterway. There is that going to lead to any uh, further complications or time delays? Pop up that. Um, we uh, we retained the services of a uh, marine archaeologist. Uh, they came in and did their work, uh, their field work, uh, last Wednesday. Uh, what you're seeing here is a side scan sonar compilation of the work area. Um, and uh, in the upper middle portion of the, of the uh, slide, you see the 62 meters approximate. That's wreck one. That was the wreck that was originally found. And, uh, and I think we've got a subject confirmation. We've got a fairly good handle on, on uh, what the origin of that, that vessel is. What was interesting was the other two wrecks that we found. Uh, they're in the lower portion of, uh, of the slide. Um, one is of a, uh, of a schooner, a two-masted schooner that apparently was constructed in the middle 1850s. Uh, the second of the two vessels we don't know as yet, but I'm waiting for confirmation. And what you can see is off the uh, lower edge of the first wreck is our pipe. Um, we will uh, have to um, redesign the diffusers in order to steer clear of the uh, of the wreck but at this point we don't see that uh, there's anything that can't be uh, um, overcome and I don't see uh, I don't see any significant cost implications at this time that's great thank you okay so Councilor Kepke I'd just like to move the recommendation containing the report that's receiving it Great, thank you. All in favor? That is carried. I uh, will note that we had a wastewater uh, treatment meeting plan uh, uh, meeting and uh, we didn't have quorum at it. Um, and I would hope that if we have a wastewater um, treatment meeting that we have to move something quickly that if we don't have a quorum we're going to run into trouble that could cause delays, it's going to uh, cause issues. Uh, we were notified of some people being away, of course, but for any of your committees, let's try and be there so we don't, we don't, uh, so we've got a quorum and we can pass things. Thanks. 12A4. Did I call the vote? Did I call the vote? Yeah. I, I will call the vote now and we'll double uh, make sure. I think I did, but uh, yeah, okay. Carried. Uh, 12A4 is verbal report from Deputy Mayor Wright. 
regard to county. This is uh, fairly short. Uh, the county launched a new tourism site uh, at the uh, meeting. Uh, it's called visitgray.ca. It's uh, first class. Uh, it highlights the best of the count the county has to offer. The city is welcome to put any in additional information on the site under the city's banner that they, if they wish to do so. I, I really want to talk about the warden's forum though for a minute. Uh, we had an excellent overview uh, at the warden's forum on economic development plan and in the Q&A uh, session of it, they stressed the importance of development charges, which was interesting. And the experience across the province shows that DCs are not uh, deterrent to development, but rather service ready land is the draw for development and that's what we put through tonight that motion about serviced uh, land uh, this is from our consultant in Ottawa and he is just saying don't think that that if you do away with development charges that you're going to create a uh, development because that isn't going to work what you need is service land to create to create development charges uh, we had a half hour presentation on broadband that was uh, uh, very interesting and in where we are in gray and um, we had an update on the county road rationalization uh, study. Uh, this was a very informative evening. Uh, Mr. Ritchie went with us. It was the mayor and I were there. Uh, that was well attended by most of the municipalities. And I'm, I'm a little uh, sorry that more of our, our councillors didn't uh, attend that meeting because it was absolutely excellent. Um, I have handed everybody a copy of the 214 year in review. This will go to every household in the county. It's a it's a good document, and it's um it's a good read. So it gives a lot more information in there on what the county is doing. And that is my report. Excellent. And, uh, Thank you. Any questions for um, Deputy Mayor Wright? Seeing none. Move on to 12B as the consent agenda. Ms. Bloomfield. Yes, through your worship, on the consent agenda is two reports from the facilities booking coordinator. One respecting a lease agreement with Keystone Child and Youth Family Services for use of Castle Beach. And their second report is respecting a lease agreement with the Heart and Stroke Foundation for the Best Friends Dog Walk at Harrison Park. There is a report from the event facilitator respecting the One World Festival extension request. Two reports from the planning assistant respecting planning notices from Georgian Bluffs. Planning notices where no report is triggered. Minutes of boards and committees for receipt from the library board and the police board and correspondence received, which is presented for the information of council. A recommendation there. Councillor Dodd. I'll move the recommendation that we receive these documents. Good. Any questions, comments? All in favor? Carried. Thank you. Um, Minutes of uh, boards and committees is 12C, starting with Accessibility Advisory Committee held on April 27th, 2015. Uh, who's on that? Councillor Lemon's on that. He's not in the room. Anyone else on that? Yeah, he was going to do it. Okay, you know what? He's going to want, he wants to talk about the hospitals. Okay, I'm going to move on then. We'll come back to that. Remind me, someone that we're coming back to that. Uh, 12C2, Minutes of the Bylaw Committee. Councillor Kepke, you doing that one? Yes, I am. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, the bylaw committee met on May the 6th, and at that meeting, we dealt with an in-camera issue respecting uh, property standards enforcement of the Black Cross and Kennedy site. And we also um, dealt with redundant policies, clerk's policies, and that report is on council's agenda, and there's a recommendation there um, that we pass a bylaw to repeal various clerk's policies that are either duplicate or redundant. And you have a listing of those there. The uh, discussion on the keeping of certain kinds of animal bylaw review. Uh, staff is preparing a report on that. And just to let you know that um, we're waiting on comments from the health unit prior to any staff report coming forward. So that matter has been tabled. And we've reviewed the action plan and put things into perspective that are achievable. Councillor Thomas, any comments? Were you, were you uh, egging on Councillor Kepke by any chance? I heard something. <laughs> he sounds like a chicken. Go ahead, Councillor Thomas. You can, you, can, you can make your comments. Don't, don't be checking. Don't check it out here. You, you, moved, uh, 
You, I will move the approval, approval of these minutes. Any, any questions for Councillor uh, Kepke on that? Um, that's, that's great. That's ducky. Can we uh, all in favor? <laughs> Carried. Thank you. Oh, yep. Sorry. I'm going to move adoption of the Accessibility Advisory Committee minutes. Okay. Councillor Kepke. Just a comment on those minutes, Your Worship. Um, I was happy to see that there is some attention being brought to the issue of um, specialized transit and there's been a report requested there and I'm looking forward to receiving something on that from staff. Great, thank you. Uh, so moved by Councilor McManaman, all in favor? Carried, thanks. Uh, Deputy Mayor Wright, do you wanna grab the chair and I'll do the, the switch seats for finance? Uh, Mayor Body, are you doing the Finance Committee? Oh, I'd love to. Thank you. Um, finance Committee met May 5th. There was five reports. One of them I'm going to skip because uh, Ms. Malone just presented them. Uh, there was one report dealing with the request that had come from Blue Water Curling Club for uh, to be designated as a charitable organization or not-for-profit. Um, it was determined that for us to do that, it has to be done at the upper tier. Uh, we would need the consensus of all the other lower tiers. Um, um, we received the report and did not move anything ahead on that given that there's uh, many other not-for-profit or charitable organizations that uh, also pay taxes on their property. B was covered. Next matter was a report um, with regard to reserve balances as of December 31st, 2014. In total, we are holding $33,492,796.89 in reserves. There is a total of 84 separate funds. The city is proactively managing capital equipment. So anything, any of our rolling stock, we have uh, good reserves on those. Reserves are an important component of the city's long-range financial planning strategy and a critical tool in ensuring f uh, fiscal responsibility <clears throat> reserves are used to provide funds to cover future replacement or acquisition costs of capital assets. Um, there are three major areas uh, that can be categorized as revenue funds, which are specific projects and purposes, and we're holding $4,839,993. Um, there is obligatory funds uh, held for parklands, some cemetery reserves, parking reserves, federal and provincial gas tax for transit, uh, sick bank reserves for staffing and development charge reserves, and they total $3,306,000 approximately, and then there's capital reserve funds that are broken down to include specific funds for Harrison Park Campground, library, equipment reserves for works, traffic, water, parks, fire, cemetery, library, art gallery, airport, specialized transit, water and sewer plant, and are set aside to assist in funding major, again, capital infrastructure. Um, of course, our biggest reserve is the money that was received by the city in 2001 for the Georgian Bay energy sale. That money is used to fund uh, our projects. We borrow from ourselves, basically. And then um, with some of that money that uh, the interest accumulates allows us to pay off all of it. So we're maintaining all the money that was ever received from the uh, Georgian Bay energy sale. None of it has gone away and, and we borrow from ourselves. Uh, staff is proposing that winter maintenance reserve fund be established specifically under that name effective in 2015 to assist with the fluctuating uh, winter conditions. In the past, it has been held in a general reserve fund uh, that we've been able to use. Uh, the last report, and I think at some point we should get this uh, coming to council, is from the manager of uh, information technology 
reviewing the SWIFT initiative, an overview, so for uh, fiber coming to the city of Owen Sound, uh, Southwest integrated fiber technology that would be creating ultra high speed fiber optic uh, regional broadband network for everyone including businesses and residents in Western Ontario. The goal is to uh, provide access to one gigabyte uh, for under $100 per month to each house and each business. Um, we need a lot more information on this, and I'm not doing it any justice. It's very interesting. The, the growth, and it's not, uh, it's not in the report, the growth of uh, gigabyte use uh, when, when smartphones came in between 2008 and 2011 was unbelievable. And I can't remember the exact numbers, but it was, it was stunning. The uh, cost for the Southwestern, um, for SWIFT, so right through the whole Southwest Economic Alliance, uh, is $234 million that we're hoping to get uh, funding from province and federal governments for infrastructure for this uh, whole area. So it includes London, Guelph, Barrie, and Owen Sound as being hubs, so that's good. We should be one of the first ones that will get uh, fiber. And that is my report. I'm going to be careful and actually ask um, Councillor Kepke to move receipt of it. Excuse me. Councillor Kepke, would you like to move the report? <laughs> Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Wright. I'm pleased to move uh, approval of the financial advisory minutes. Thank you. Any uh, questions about this? All those in favor? <laughs> That motion carries. Uh, D Deputy Mayor Wright, may I please ask Councillor Kepke <coughs> to move it for me just so I don't get my hands wrapped. Is that better? She's already moved it. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure. I was just trying to do it right this time. <coughs> Thank you. You have you. the chair back now. <laughs> you have the right person in the chair. Rules, rules, <laughs> rules. You need to have a lawyer around here to figure this stuff out. Thank you very much. We're down to uh, 12D, which is minutes of in-camera meetings for approval. Councilor McManaman. Uh, so moved, I'll move all those uh, in camera minutes. Okay, any questions? No, approval of that. All in favor? It's carried. Uh, 12E is minutes of in camera meeting for receipt, which is the in camera on some municipal non profit housing corporation meeting which occurred on March 17th, 2015. Councilor O'Leary is moving those. All in favor? Great, thank you. We're down to 13, which is other business. And I'm starting with uh, Councillor Kepke with her report from the Ontario Small Urban Municipalities Conference. Thank you, Your Worship, which was held in Belleville uh, recently. I'll just uh, briefly describe what took place there. There was an economics uh, keynote speaker who Focused, uh, focused on where Canada was in the world, which was extremely interesting. Um, another keynote speaker on advertising and marketing, and his uh, title was Trends with Benefits. He talked a lot about the boomers and different generations and so on. Uh, there was a workshop on partnering for economic development success, which was put on by OMAFRA, the Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, and it was on community economic development. There was a tour of a Build Belleville project, and I found this to be extremely interesting. Uh, Belleville has taken 22 projects and put it under one center and branded it as a Build Belleville, and they are marketing and um, their Build Belleville projects that way, and the progress and benefits of these buildings, as well as the underground and streetscape. The, this way that makes their plans shovel ready should there be any grants available for these projects. And they're, um, they have a lot of community buyback into this project. The, uh, Jeff Leal, the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs spoke. Uh, Premier Kathleen Wynne was there who spoke and um, did answer questions. Uh, she identified that the budget highlights are to invest in infrastructure, by providing funds to build and rebuild priority infrastructure, and that's the Moving Ontario funding. And the distribution on that is on a per capita basis, 
uh, to maintain equitable distribution. Um, money, there will be money to a new connection, connecting link program, um, and they will consult to ensure the program design works locally. And they're talking about bringing natural gas to underserviced communities. Um, the next speaker we had was uh, a, par a parliamentary assistant to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And one interesting point that he had was that uh, the province is re reviewing the disaster relief funding and they're doing this to help with extreme weather events. Um, and they feel there's room for improvement in the program, and so that's why it's being review reviewed. They expect to complete that work this year. So hopefully um, our disaster that happened is on the radar for future. Uh, another speaker from AMO um, regarding fiscal responsibility and sustainability. Speaker, um, program advisor to the Accessibility Directorate of Ontario, and he talked about what was new in 2015. One of the highlights I found from that was, um, other than all the, the uh, regulations they're going through, is that they're recognizing an AODA champion with an award in the community, and they're looking for nominations by June 30th for provincial recognition. So I would hope that um, our committee would maybe look at a possibility there of nominating any individuals for provincial recognition in that category. There was an AMO task force on policing in Ontario, and there was a panel of speakers on that, and it was the modernization of policing report and building a new public safety model in Ontario. They identified their top priorities as um, making changes to the interest arbitration system, improving the quality of the existing governance and civilian oversight system, making legislative changes to permit the greater transfer of specific functions to civilians or other security providers where appropriate. And as well, there were 31 other recommendations that were divided into four key themes of partnership, productivity, performance, and personnel. Um, once the document has been reviewed by police services and, and council, AMO's looking forward to, for support uh, by resolution of councils from this. There was also a, a surprise guest appearance by the Lieutenant Governor, Elizabeth Dowd as well, and who's a, a very uh, lovely lady, and she um, brought greetings and it was nice to see her. Next year's OSM conference is on May the 4th in Godrich. That's my report. Great, thank you. Councillor Thomas, I think, was going to follow up with some awesome. Yes, with a much deeper and longer description of the conference. Well, now that I've worship, rushed everybody, uh, I'm looking at it. it's 9.30, so I, you can I, go no, for an hour. I, I'd actually just like to make a couple of quick points uh, to build on the, the two main keynote speakers that we saw. The first was uh, Benjamin Tull, who is the Deputy Chief Economist for uh, CIBC, and uh, his presentation was actually very optimistic. Uh, when he started talking about what had happened with oil prices in the world, uh, everyone got a little bit gloomy in the room, but he, became, he, he brought it around to a very upbeat point. And I can sum it up by saying that, that he feels that there's going to be a great resurgence, believe it or not, in North American manufacturing, which surprised many of us in the room. And he was advocating for municipalities to prepare for it because those who are prepared when it comes will do very well. And all of it goes back to a change in policy that, ch that the Chinese government made, which is now going to open up a market of 250 million 18 to, 20, 18 to 34 year old consumers in mainland China who have a thirst for Western goods. So it was really interesting and it was a very, very positive and upbeat look at the possibilities for the North American co economy. And I found that quite refreshing given what we normally hear about the North American economy. Uh, the second speaker uh, who was talking about uh, social media and I, Max Valaket, you know, he made a really interesting point. He started by asking how many of us were communicating with our ratepayers by website and of course we all put our hands up and he said, well, you're all way behind the times and you need to change. And what he, you know, the, the stats that he rolled out were the fact that uh, you know, 60 to 80% of people never turn on a computer anymore. 
they are all using their smartphones to access everything on the internet. And he said, if you're working on a website, you're way behind the wave and you're going to get left behind. And he said that what municipalities need to start looking at is a municipal app for smartphones. So I'm not going to make any recommendations on that here tonight, but I will be taking that forward certainly to the Economic Development Committee uh, as an idea that perhaps we can pursue. He did suggest that it can be very expensive to do that and that what many municipalities are doing are getting a small group of uh, municipalities together, partnering on the development of the app, and then each of them having their own skin on the app to make it look as though it's their own individual app. So that was just a very interesting uh, perspective uh, given, given all the talk we have about communication and communicating with, uh, with our residents. I, I think it's uh, some good information that we can take forward. Uh, all in all, it was well worth going to the conference. I, I'm always a little bit leery about those things, but I really quite enjoyed it, and I thought there was a lot of great information uh, gained from it. Uh, the other item I have tonight, uh, I'm happy to uh, announce for everybody that the map of the city's trails network uh, is finally out and available for members of the public at our tourism office. Now, I've already learned something from this map, believe it or not. It, it includes... Uh, all of the trails in the city and 18 catwalks. Now I had no idea, I know we have a lot of catwalks, I had no idea there were 18 catwalks at Owen Sound joining uh, various streets uh, together here, there, and everywhere. Uh, it also includes two looped hikes, one of which is through Harrison Park and is fully accessible, Councillor Lemon. And the second more challenging hike is on the Bruce Trail east of the Parkview Estates. I just want to add that we've got uh, some thanks here. The Tourism Department wants to thank the uh, Grace Auble Conservation Authority, the Sydenham and Bruce Trail Club, and the Tom Thompson Trail Group for assisting with the uh, assembly of this guide. And I don't know whether the Director of Community Services has anything to add that I've missed here, but uh, I think it's very exciting, and I think we need an app for this next. Questions, comments, Councillor Lemon? Yeah, um, I talked to uh, a few people about apps, and you just said something that caught my attention where a group of municipalities come together, working together, i.e. Gray County. I already wrote it down. Okay, you're ahead of me, because this is an example where cooperation at the county level can yield great benefits. And the, after talking to Richard this last week, it was, and I checked about the apps and how people use them. Yeah, I, I didn't realize how many people uh, use the apps and uh, it's an opportunity. Like, and this is a perfect example that something could go on that app so you could find out, gee, in Owen Sound, I can, you know, some of the trails are a little more challenging than others. Uh, and it's wonderful, and congratulations on that. I'm glad you brought that back, and I think it's well worth pursuing. Councillor Thomas, I think we're meeting with um, George and Bluffs in a joint meeting in the next little while. Maybe that's a good place to raise it as well. I think so. Good, thank you. Uh, Mr. Becking is next in the list. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, just to bring uh, Council up to speed, um, as you're aware, uh, City Transit Service is provided through First Student, uh, our contractor. Um, their, uh, their staff is uh, represented by Unifor, and uh, the parties are currently in the process of negotiating a, uh, a new collective agreement. Um, it's our understanding from uh, correspondence that we've had with the contractor that uh, good progress is being made and they're continuing to work towards a uh, amicable solution. Um, at this point, um, there is no suggestion that there would be a, jo a job action or potential job action. Um, uh, the soonest uh, that the uh, uh, union could be in a position of uh, giving notice of intent to strike would be the 20th of May, so we're still uh, a long way away uh, from that and uh, that uh, uh, they will be, um, they have a number of sessions scheduled uh, on that time, or up to that time and beyond that time, so uh, they'll keep working at it. Um, 
so uh, if there's anything new that comes about, uh, I'll be uh, providing council with an update. Great, thank you. Next on the list is uh, Ms. Coulter. Thank you, Worship. The city had submitted a grant application to the federal government for uh, funding for a local entertainment comp component for the Pan Am torch relay that would really celebrate our cultural diversity here in Old Sound. Uh, we've been notified, and you may have heard uh, M uh, MP Larry Miller on the radio indicating that the city has received a $10,000 grant, so that's good news. And the event is when? June 11th and 12th. Good, thank you. At the Bay Shore, it'll be set up with stages, sort of like hockey, uh, hometown hockey. So it'll be a great event. Thank you, Councillor Lemon. Yeah, there was something I forgot. I'll be brief, if you don't mind. Uh, next Go year ahead. is the 150th anniversary of the Gray and Simcoe Foresters. And I was wondering, have we heard anything about a 150th anniversary celebration? Um, yes. It'll be, it'll be announced when, when they need to announce things. We've, okay. we've, met, we've met with them. All right, thank yeah, you. yeah, we've met thank with you. them. I'm glad you have. I just realized a couple of days ago that the 150th was next year. Yeah. If I can highlight just a couple things that I've done uh, in, in the last two weeks since uh, here the last time. Um, first of all, last Saturday was uh, quite a day. We started off with the flagpole dedication at the Corporate Robert James Mitchell Park. And uh, to get to it, off of 4th Avenue West, you turn east onto Beatty Street and then take your first left. It's a little bit confusing, but it's down in there, and it's a really beautiful park with lots of old pines. Um, two benches, uh, one recognizing uh, both of the Mitchell boys, and uh, now that the flag is up, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty special park. Uh, we had a ceremony there with uh, uh, Colonel Daniel McIsaac, who was, uh, did his training as a cadet in Owen Sound, and went on and is now a colonel and um, uh, heading the um, Gage Town in uh, New Brunswick. Very, very nice guy. Um, from there, I went to uh, the 117th, which is pretty neat, annual revo review of the Gray Simcoe Foresters uh, Royal Canadian Army Cadet Corps at the Armouries. Uh, again, Colonel McIsaac was there to, uh, to do the review. Uh, the kids work awfully hard on their marching and on the music and uh, everything, and it's, uh, it shows they're very, very dedicated. There's been a lot of kids that have gone through the uh, cadets over the years, the Grace Simcoe cadets, and went on to have engineering degrees and things, uh, RMC. There's a couple kids that I talked to that uh, that's their plan to go to RMC. And uh, the person that was leading the youth group, uh, who, who's uh, the cadets, who is still a youth, happened to be the young woman by the name of Body, B-O-D-D-Y, -D -D that I'd never met before, and uh, she's pretty impressive. And her sister is in the group, too. And it made it that much uh, more special for me to, to meet them after and uh, talk to them. Um, attended a Lions Club dinner. Attended the 75th anniversary of CFOS. We know how uh, important that is to our uh, community to, to be around for 75 years and everyone's got great memories. Attended uh, the Qantas Club 90th anniversary on Saturday night and boy, there's another group that's uh, pretty special in our community with everything from parks to uh, skateboard parks to soccer fields to Santa Claus parades to trees when somebody gets them organized. Who looks after that, Jim? That wouldn't be you, would it? Um, I, I, I raised when I was there, and you think about the, uh, the Santa Claus parade, and it's that first opportunity for kids to see Santa. But it might be more important is the first opportunity for kids to be able to perform and do something in public. All of us remember being kids, and I remember my son, the first time he got to play in the Santa Claus parade was really huge for him, and that might be more important uh, then, then, the, the the magic of Christmas for uh, for Tots. Uh, of course, it's the 83rd year of the Kwanas Music Festival. My mother played at the first in uh, Meaford. We had some gold medals that she had received. That I was able to uh, display there. Um, 
so those are some of the activities that I've participated in as mayor in the last uh, two weeks. Um, I know there's things coming up in the next two weeks, and I look forward to presenting some of the things that went on in, uh, in two weeks from now. Thanks. I think that covers off all of other business. So motion that the committee rise. So moved. Uh, all in favor? He did. Okay, I'll get you to I'll make move that. the committee move the committee rise, Your Worship. Great, thank you. <laughs> See, I, I'm not going to cross Deputy Mayor Wright twice in one night. All in favor? That is carried. Thank you. Um, where are we at? 15 resolution adopting proceedings in Committee of the Whole. Thank you, Worship. I move by myself, seconded by Councillor Thomas, that the action taken in the Committee of the Whole in considering public meetings, deputations, public question period, matters arising from correspondence, reports, matters tabled, motions for which notice was previously given, and other business be hereby confirmed by this Council. And all in favor? That is carried. Uh, notices of motion, I see none. Um, new business by resolution, I see none. Number 18, bylaws. Thank you, Your Worship. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Thomas. That bylaws number 2015 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, and 2015 70 be hereby passed and enacted. And all in favor? It's carried. Our business is completed.